How are the heavenly little marshmallow treats really made? And what exactly is in there? Is there a difference between the ones you make at home and the peeps you just can't resist picking up at the store? Join us as we find out how marshmallows are really made. Americans do love their marshmallows. As a nation, the National Confectioners Association says that around 90 million pounds of marshmallow are sold every year, which is about the same weight as 1,286 grey whales. But what exactly is in the sugary treats? According to the American Chemical Society, the ingredients in most marshmallows are pretty much what you'd expect. You have your sugar, corn syrup, modified cornstarch, and gelatin. And air is so important to the process that it's pretty much an ingredient too, because you can't achieve that pillowy texture without it. Some types of marshmallows might also have some coloring or flavoring added, but for the most part, the ingredients are pretty simple. Most of the ingredients in marshmallows are pretty well known, but then there's gelatin. According to the American Chemical Society, gelatin is important to the process because it's what gives marshmallows that fluffy, elastic, squishy texture. Food scientists say that when all the ingredients are whipped together, gelatin essentially acts to bind liquid into the mixture. That creates the fluffy foam that becomes your marshmallow, and it also acts to extend the shelf life of the product. Marshmallows can kick around in the cabinet for up to 24 months and still be perfectly fine. Most of us consume gelatin every day, I certainly do. As for what gelatin is, here's where things get yucky. According to Healthline, gelatin is made by cooking collagen, which is the connective tissue found in things like bones, ligaments, and skin. So instead of going to waste, those parts are boiled to make gelatin. It's high in protein and contains vital amino acids, so consider your marshmallows super healthy. According to how products are made, there are two types of ingredients that go into making marshmallows, and they are emulsifying agents and sweeteners. Sweeteners, like sugar and corn syrup, provide the flavor. Meanwhile, emulsifiers create that distinctive texture. A marshmallow needs to be able to hold its shape while still incorporating a lot of air, and emulsifiers are how that happens. The whole marshmallow making process usually starts by mixing sugar, corn syrup and water, then bringing it to a boil. The gelatin is added at this point, and after the mixture is strained, it's whipped a lot. The whipping process is incredibly important, and at this point, the mixture will turn foamy and double or triple in size, thanks to air, and any additional flavors are added to the mix. Before extrusion was added to the marshmallow making process in the 1950s, the marshmallow shaping was done by hand. According to the New York Times, a century ago, confectioners made marshmallows from a froth of sugar, starch, and gelatin in a laborious process that involved lots of primping. Each candy had to sweat for several hours to form its delicate skin, and then it was sprinkled with starch. However, candy company executive Alex Dumac came up with the idea of treating the goopy, raw marshmallow dough as though it was something more industrial than food, and he ultimately developed the extrusion machine that's still used today. Basically, the raw material gets pushed through long tubes and put under extreme pressure. By the time it gets to the end of the machine, long whips of marshmallows have been formed. Those are then sliced into the bite-sized chunks we know and love in a fraction of the time it used to take. This clever method is sometimes dubbed jet puffed. Pastry chefs across the country are embracing the marshmallow as something sweet and delicious that they can put their own spin on. As chef Peter Brett told the Washington Post, a homemade marshmallow is really a revelation. It's like magic, simple syrup turning into marshmallow. I always thought marshmallow was something that had to be made in 500 gallon vats in a big factory. Something very mysterious. Remember, marshmallows are really healthy, so just a small amount of sugar. <laughs> and author Jennifer Reese told NPR, they just taste so much better. They're just more delicious. They don't turn out to be cheaper, but they are better. After you have tasted a sugar white homemade marshmallow, you will not care. Homemade marshmallows are fairy food, pillowy, quivering, and soft. According to Reese, making marshmallows at home isn't particularly difficult, but it's not necessarily cheaper than buying the store-bought ones. The process is much the same, though, as you boil your ingredients, whip them into a foam, and let the mixture set. People have been enjoying marshmallows for a really long time, and it goes all the way back to ancient Egypt. Those original marshmallows were made differently, though. According to ThoughtCo, honey was the original sweetener, and it was sap from the marshmallow plant that was used to thicken the candies. Marshmallow plants were, as their name suggests, harvested from alongside large bodies of water. They were used well into the 19th century, when the sap was removed, cooked with egg whites and sugar, then whipped. 
These original marshmallow candies were also considered to be medicinal. According to Medical News Today, there have been studies that seem to confirm that the root of the marshmallow plant can be used to successfully treat coughs, chronic dry mouth, skin irritation, and may also speed wound healing. If only modern-day marshmallows had healing properties, everyone knows that there's nothing quite like a fluff and utter sandwich. So, when it comes to marshmallow fluff, what's so different about the recipe? According to the American Chemical Society, egg whites were previously used in most standard marshmallow recipes, but they've since been dropped from most store-bought products. However, egg whites are still used in marshmallow fluff, and that's what gives it that extra gooey texture. Marshmallow fluff was actually invented in the 1890s, and it was also originally considered to be medicinal. One company sang its praises as a wrinkle remover, and if you can get people to smear marshmallow fluff on their faces, that's some brilliant marketing. But the marshmallow fluff we know and love today is a little different, and was reportedly developed in 1917 by Archibald Query. It uses just four ingredients, which are dried egg whites, sugar, corn syrup, and vanilla. So now you know. It's not exactly something you ever want to hear, but the sad truth is that some of the things you eat come from some seriously questionable sources. The manufacturing process for these foods is so disturbing that you're bound to want to stop eating them, no matter how good they taste. Okay, so not all hot dogs are created equal, and some can be far worse than others. But even the process of actually making hot dogs is kind of gross. The National Hot Dog and Sausage Council states that hot dogs are made with trimmings, which is true, but it's not the whole truth. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN defines trimmings as The raw meat materials used for pre-cooked cooked products are lower-grade muscle trimmings, fatty tissues, head meat, animal feet, animal skin, blood, liver, and other edible slaughter byproducts. You know, I thought I'd have a stomachache right now, but weirdly… I do. The FAO also refers to it as meat batter, which is a pretty perfect example of two words that should never go together. During the actual manufacturing process, all these trimmings go through a series of pre-cooking, pureeing, and seasoning processes, after which they're squeezed into casings, which are often made of animal intestines. And there's no amount of ketchup and mustard that can cover up that knowledge. When Belgian filmmaker Alina Niepkins made a short film documenting every step in the process of making gummy bears, she found a process so graphic and messed up that it's sure to have anyone swearing them off for life. The main problem here is gelatin, one of the key ingredients in gummy bears. Well, before the bright colors are added and the fun shapes are formed, animal carcasses are broken down and cut into pieces, with the skin and bones boiled in water for a long, long time. It's all done just to get that gelatin, which is what gives the gummy treats their gummy texture. And if that's making you want a wretch, don't fret too much, because there's actually another option here. Vegan gummy bears get their texture from agar which is sourced from algae and totally bypasses the whole bone-grinding slaughter thing. According to a report by the BBC, Nestle pays just $524 a year for a permit to extract millions of gallons of water out of California's national forests. In 2015, they even diverted 36 million gallons at the same time state residents were living under strict water use regulations and drought conditions. The worst thing about that is that a huge amount of that water is wasted during the manufacturing process. Business Insider suggests that the general rule of thumb is that, however much water is in the bottle, you can estimate it took about three times that much to make the container. And it's not just water they use either, it takes about 17 million barrels of oil to make all the bottles for the bottled water sold in a year. The same amount that would have kept one million cars running for that same year. Don't go thinking the water you're drinking is much better than tap water either. Food and Water Watch found that 52% of bottled water in 2009 came from the same public sources that feed your tap. By 2018, that figure had risen to 64%. Worse still, bottled water isn't even subject to the same water safety processes and standards that have to be met by public water sources. It's just more wasteful. According to the Huffington Post, deli meats such as bologna and olive loaf first came about because manufacturers needed a way to use all the animal parts that people just wouldn't buy separately. These leftovers were pureed, mixed, and molded together and turned into the sandwich meats we all know and love. But that's not the end of the story. In 2006, the FDA approved an extra step in the manufacturing process, one that is supposed to help prevent the thousands of cases of food poisoning related in the U.S. every year, which are connected to the bacteria growing on deli meats. Listeria was responsible for around 500 deaths annually, and manufacturers now combat that by spraying their product with a cocktail of six different viruses. 
The spray is added before meat is packaged, and the viruses are types that only attack bacteria, meaning they're safe for human consumption. But that doesn't make it any less gross. Did you ever try those Jelly Belly boxes with the really gross flavors? Harry Potter fans will know them as Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans, but they're also available as part of Jelly Belly's Bean Boozled product line. And they can be great, too, if you're prepared for the possibility of eating something that tastes like vomit, skunk odor, or rotten eggs. George swear he got a bogey-flavored one once. But how do they get the flavors so spot on? According to Mental Floss, Jelly Belly takes the real thing and puts it into a gas chromatograph. The object is then heated, which releases vapors of the stink they're trying to recreate. The machine maps the chemical makeup of the stink, translates it into flavors, and then it's remade into Jelly Belly flavor juice. In a nutshell, the beans taste so realistic because they're based on the exact chemical signature of all the things they're labeled as. Still hungry? Ever wonder how fresh-squeezed orange juice still shows up on grocery store shelves in the middle of winter? Well, the whole process was documented in Alyssa Hamilton's 2009 book, Squeezed. What you don't know about orange juice. Here are the basics. Once the oranges are harvested and squeezed, the juice is put through a process that removes all of the oxygen, allowing manufacturers to store what's left of the juice in massive tanks, where it can sit for a whole year or more. When it's time to use the liquid, it doesn't just need to be reoxygenated, it's also been stripped of most of its flavor, which is then added back in with flavor packs produced by companies which specialize in creating flavor and fragrance additives. This also allows companies to tweak flavors based on customer feedback and consumer tastes. Put short, they're artificially adding the flavors they took away in an attempt to make the juice last longer. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? It's not surprising that there are all kinds of strange things that go on during the manufacturing of wine, with some processes even taking place while the grape is still on the vine. Ice wine, for example, is only made from grapes that have been frozen before being picked, making a super sweet dessert wine. But one other dessert wine, which is grown mainly in the Bordeaux region of France, gets its sweetness in an even weirder way. It's actually quite surprising that Sauterne wine is so expensive, considering that it's made from rotten grapes. Of course, they're not just any rotten grapes, they've got to be infected by a fungus called noble rot. Noble rot works because the grapes are essentially turned to raisins as the fungus grows. That way, they have less water but the same amount of sugar content, which translates to a sweeter wine with a higher alcohol content. According to Vine Pear, no one's really sure when the practice started because the winemakers who first used it didn't tell anyone how they were getting all that sweet flavor into their wine. Honestly, can you blame them? Remember that pink slime image which circulated a few years back? It was mostly associated with McDonald's, and much of the outrage came from the idea that the chain was using the nasty substance as one of their major ingredients. But many people didn't realize that the same pink slime is regularly used to make most ground beef. More accurately known as lean, finely textured beef or boneless beef trimmings, this stuff is essentially made when small pieces of lean meat, usually cuttings and trimmings from other processes, are ground down and sometimes treated with a mix of water and ammonium hydroxide. They're then added to the ground beef to bulk up the product, make it leaner, and use up more of the animal. The FDA has declared it completely safe, but if you're still outraged, then you'll probably want to know that it's likely found in the ground beef you regularly pick up at the grocery store. Worcestershire sauce may have first been made in England back in the 19th century, but the process which chemists used to create it back then is still used today. Like those early first batches, it takes years of stewing in buckets and barrels to make modern Worcestershire sauce. First, pickled onion and garlic is left sitting in malt vinegar for up to 24 months. In other barrels, anchovies sit in salt for months on end, too. Most of the other ingredients and exact quantities used are a closely guarded secret, but we do know there's a lot of white and malt vinegar, molasses, and sugar, which all gets mixed together after it's sat and fermented and liquefied for an appropriately long time. It's then pumped into holding tanks where it stews for an equally long stretch of time. Finally, the sauce is strained several times to get all the chunky bits out, ultimately turning the mixture into something that honestly does taste way better than it sounds. It's worse, 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 worse. <laughs> Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Let's be honest, the planet is in a pretty dire state these days. But one way to make a small yet beneficial change is to cut out hard and aged cheeses from your diet. According to the Environmental Working Group, cheese is one of the foods which hits the environment hardest. It takes an average of 10 pounds of milk to make just a pound of cheese. 
and even the cows themselves have a devastating impact on the environment. Thanks partly to the gases they produce and partly because of the massive amounts of food they eat. Milk products are also particularly bad for the planet because their byproducts contribute massively to the process of eutrophication, a type of nutrient pollution that's killing off the planet's fish. Aged cheeses present their own problems too because the process of aging them requires them to be kept in a climate-controlled space. And for most places in America, that means using up a ton of electricity. Many of the grains used in cereals are prepped for consumption using a high-temperature process known as extrusion. The grains are cooked, certain components are removed, and then they're forced through a machine designed to reshape the grain into the desired form and texture. A study in the International Journal of Food Science and Technology looked at the impact of extrusion on nutritional quality and found that while some good things come out of the process, such as sterilization of the grains, some pretty messed up things happen too. Vitamins can be very easily destroyed during extrusion, including beta-carotene, vitamin C, and antioxidants. The process has also been found to greatly reduce the number of cancer-fighting compounds in soy, as well as the soy isoflavins credited for helping protect against heart disease, osteoporosis, and cancer. While extrusion is generally viewed as a massive step forward in the world of food processing, the loss of these beneficial compounds is something you might want to keep in mind if you rely on cereal for a nutritional boost. Because in most cases, you're only eating a bowl of carbohydrates that have little nutritional value. How much do you really know about smoked salmon? If you've ever had it, you know it's delicious. But do you know how it got that way? What's the process? Is it really cooked or is it raw? Is it even safe to eat? This is how smoked salmon is really made. Salmon for everyone! On me! Yeah. First things first, what do we mean when we say smoked salmon? It turns out that a pretty generic term for that could refer to any number of products. The fish itself could be farm-raised or wild-caught, and the form could be cut into fillets or sliced into steaks. Some smoked salmon is cured and cold-smoked to create a raw but edible fish with a sushi-like texture, while others are cooked over hot smoke to turn out firm and flaky. They all start out the same way. The fish is brined in a salt solution to pull out the moisture and prevent the growth of bacteria. After that, hot and cold smoked fish are dried and smoked. While you could technically smoke the salmon whole, you wouldn't really want to. It's easier to find the bones and remove them before you smoke a fish, plus there's the whole skin-on-skin -skin or skinless debate. You could cut the fish into steaks, but the most popular way to smoke salmon is by removing the meaty fillets on each side of the backbone. Most fish fillets still contain a few tiny bones called pin bones. They're super easy to remove if you drape the fillet over an upside-down bowl and remove the protruding bones using a pair of tweezers, as Tasting Table recommends. Now it's time to decide whether you want to smoke the salmon with the skin on or off. Thermoworks advises that keeping the skin on helps the meat hold together as it cooks, but the salmon absorbs the cure better without it. The skin can also lead to off flavors, and although it does have nutrient value, the skin can become soggy and chewy when smoked. Since most people don't eat the skin on the cooked fish anyway, we'd just as soon remove it now rather than later. After preparing the salmon filet, the next step is to apply salt to the fish. Salt gets a bad rap, but its importance in seasoning and preservation cannot be underplayed. There are two ways to cure salmon, wet or dry. Applying a dry cure means covering the fish in salt and rinsing off the excess after a long period of time, anywhere between an hour and a full day. With a wet cure, a brine is prepared using salt and sugar, and the salmon is submerged in the liquid for around 6 to 10 hours. By the end of the brining process, the salt has done a lot for your piece of salmon. Not only does it remove some of the moisture, helping to stay fresh longer and tolerate the smoking process better, but it also improves and intensifies the flavor. The sugar has a job to do too. Aside from adding some sweet flavor, sugar helps the salmon absorb moisture, allowing it to take on some of the wet brine after the salt has pushed out the fish's original moisture. Now that it's been cured, there's only one more step before we can add that delicious, smoky flavor. It's time to develop the pellicle a skin that forms on the surface of food as it's exposed to air and moisture is removed. Professional kitchens often use a fan and higher temperatures to form a pellicle on salmon in as little as 30 minutes, but most at-home recipes call for drying salmon at room temperature for one to three hours. This might seem like a step you could skip if you're in a hurry, but that protective layer has a few functions. 
First, it traps moisture inside the fish, ensuring that your final smoked salmon will be moist despite the long smoke time. It also gives the finished product an attractive glean and helps the smoke adhere to the meat as it cooks, making your smoked salmon that much more flavorful. After it's properly dried, we're finally ready to smoke the salmon. Alder is a popular wood for smoking salmon, but you can use any type of hardwood you like. Though using fir, pine, spruce, or cedar is not recommended. These woods can impart bad flavors and give the fish an unpalatable finish. For hot smoking, the kitchen recommends setting your smoker to 150 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit and smoking the fish until it reaches an internal temperature of 140 degrees at its thickest point. Depending on the thickness of the fillet, this should take about one to three hours. You'll have to then cook the fish in your oven until the salmon reaches 150 degrees at its thickest point. Remember, this is a hot smoke. That means we're actually cooking the fish as well as smoking it. With cold smoking, the smoker should never reach a temperature above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Cold smoking gives the fish a vibrant color and helps it retain moisture. But it is also technically raw, so take extreme care when handling it to avoid foodborne illness. You can eat both cold and hot smoked salmon right away if you prefer. Slice it thinly for the traditional bagel, add it to your favorite pasta for dinner, or pulse it in a food processor for a dip. Any fish you're not planning to eat immediately should be cooled and stored. The difference in temperature between the refrigerator and the fish can cause condensation in the packaging, so Food Safety News recommends cooling hot smoked salmon to at least 110 degrees Fahrenheit or colder before placing it in plastic bags, airtight containers, or vacuum-sealed packages. This isn't a problem for cold smoked salmon. Since it was only cooked to 80 degrees, you should be able to package it right up. You can store smoked salmon in the refrigerator for up to two weeks. You can keep it frozen for up to a year in plastic wrap or a freezer bag. Raw salmon can range from around $8 to $12 per pound for Atlantic farmed salmon and $11 to $20 for wild-caught varieties. But smoked salmon can cost around $30 per pound, with smoked salmon jerky coming in at nearly $50 per pound. Why does it cost so much more? Consider how much less the fish weighs after the process of brining and smoking it, as well as the waste involved. The European nonprofit media agency Yoris.com estimates that only 50% of every salmon is eaten. The heads, skin, and bones are undesirable and are usually discarded. And salting and smoking a fish can reduce its weight around 16 to 18 percent. So, a 30-pound salmon will yield as little as 12 pounds of edible smoked salmon. Smoked salmon. You know, um, for the guests, it is. For you, consider it cow meat. Strictly taboo. I eat beef. Well, then consider it poison beef. If you're hoping to increase your consumption of omega-3 fatty acids, salmon is a great way to go. Salmon is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can eat, thanks to its high-quality protein and high levels of B vitamins and minerals like potassium and selenium. It's also a great source of heart-friendly omega-3 fatty acids. So why not eat smoked salmon with every meal? Well, all that salt that keeps salmon safe from bacteria is not great for our bodies. The Globe and Mail estimates there are 666 milligrams of sodium in each 3-ounce serving of smoked salmon. Compare that to the 50 milligrams you'd get from fresh salmon. There is also some concern that commercial manufacturers add nitrites, which have been linked to cancer, to smoked salmon products. Should you eat it? Absolutely, but probably in moderation. And if you're at risk for listeria food poisoning, steer clear of the cold-smoked varieties. There are plenty of tasty hot-smoked salmon options. Or you can try cooking your salmon in another way. Despite the fact that you may have just eaten bacon, you likely don't know how it got to your plate. You know it's pork, but how's it actually made? What type of pig does it come from? Does it have to be cured? Can it be healthy? Fear not, we've got you covered. Here's how bacon is really made. The first mention of anything resembling bacon dates back to ancient China, where it took the form of salted pork belly. Until the 16th century, the term bacon referred to pretty much any pork you could find. The word itself derives from continental European dialects, including the old High German term bacho, meaning buttock. Bacon arrived in the New World with the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto, the so-called father of the American pork industry. He brought 13 pigs with him to America in 1539 and soon grew his herd to a size of 700. 
Unfortunately, things got a little out of hand, and the New World's pig population ended up expanding so rapidly and uncontrollably that wild pigs continued to run amok in New York City as late as the 19th century. Today, of course, Americans are doing their best to make amends for this by eating as much bacon as possible. Around 70% of bacon is eaten with breakfast, but it's also a hugely popular sandwich ingredient, often showing up on fine dining menus. That is so good. That is so much better than ham. So how is bacon actually made? Well, there are actually two primary methods. The first is dry curing, an older, more traditional method of bacon production. The raw bacon is first rubbed with salt and seasonings as a way of giving the meat flavor, before allowing it to cure for between one or two weeks. After the bacon is cured, it's rinsed off, dried, and put into a smoker to help add more flavor and preserve the meat. Not all bacon is smoked, however, and sometimes dry cured bacon is hung to air dry in the cold for several weeks or months. Because the curing process is so time-consuming, it's not often used in the United States today. That's not to say it's not available, however. If you can get your hands on some dry-cured bacon, it's worth doing, if for no other reason than to enjoy its deeper, most robust flavor profile. Most of the bacon Americans eat nowadays is wet-cured, since this fast method is more suitable for industrial mass production. To begin, a number of curing ingredients, including salt, sugar, sodium nitrate, and other chemicals, are mixed together to create a brine. The raw bacon is then soaked in or injected with this brine. Sometimes, like dry-cured bacon, wet-cured bacon is smoked for flavor. Most of the time, however, the bacon is placed in a convection oven for around six hours, with liquid smoke occasionally added to give the meat a smokier flavor. Generally, wet-cured bacon is high in moisture and lacking in flavor. That added moisture also makes it heavier, which actually makes it more expensive. As a result, you're usually better off buying dry-cured bacon. Although it may be pricier per pound, its weight comes from the meat itself rather than the water contained within. Although bacon tends to be either wet-cured or dry-cured, there are changes and additions you can make to the curing process that result in different varieties. Wiltshire curing, for example, is a type of wet cure that involves curing the pork bone in and rind on in a special recipe brine for up to two days. After that, it's kept in cold storage for two weeks to allow it to mature, giving the finished bacon a subtly salty flavor and a meaty texture. Maple curing includes maple syrup in the curing mixture. The meat is cured for up to five days and then smoked, resulting in a smoky, woody flavor with a hint of sweetness. You can also sweet cure bacon using a range of ingredients including sugars like muscovado, demerara, and molasses, and spices such as juniper. Adding this extra sugar instills the bacon with a smoky and syrupy flavor and a very sweet aroma. I like waking up to the smell of bacon. Sue me. Uncured bacon exists because the wet curing process involves adding nitrates to bacon meat. Unfortunately, nitrates may come with some health risks attached, including elevated cancer risk. Confusingly, uncured bacon isn't actually uncured, it's just cured with celery powder and salt. The idea is that celery contains natural nitrates, rather than the artificial ones used in the mass production of bacon. Nitrates of some kind are totally necessary. They maintain flavor, prevent odors, and delay the growth of harmful bacteria. Unfortunately, it's still not certain whether natural nitrates are any less harmful than artificial nitrates, meaning it's currently impossible to know whether uncured bacon is better for you. No, I want my bacon. I gotta tell you something. Bacon is good for me. As with many mass-produced foods, wet-cured bacon contains a number of additives. You already know about the artificial nitrates, but all wet-cured bacon must also contain either ascorbate or sodium erythorbate, chemicals which accelerate the reaction between the nitrates and the meat, reducing the formations of nitrosamines. Nitrosamines are essentially carcinogenic compounds that appear when you combine nitrates and naturally broken down proteins called amines. And although they only appear in small amounts, the fewer your bacon contains, the better. Ascorbate and sodium erythorbate play an important part in reducing the harmful effects of nitrates. So here's a question. Is bacon bad for you? Well, yes and no. According to Healthline, bacon contains 50% monounsaturated fat, mostly oleic acid, 40% saturated fat, 10% polyunsaturated fat, and a decent amount of cholesterol. Most of this isn't too much of a problem, and oleic acid is actually considered a heart-healthy substance. 
Unfortunately, saturated fat is more harmful and might increase risk factors for heart disease. This isn't a certainty, however, and the small serving size of bacon means that as long as you live an otherwise healthy lifestyle, the saturated fat it contains probably isn't going to cause much trouble. Bacon also contains a number of healthy nutrients. A typical 3.5 ounce portion, for example, contains 37 grams of protein, vitamins B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, and B12, as well as iron, magnesium, zinc, and potassium. It's worth noting, however, that these nutrients are also present in other, less processed foods. Finally, there's salt. Because salt is used in both dry curing and wet curing, all bacon has a high salt content. Consume too much salt and you put yourself at risk of stomach cancer, high blood pressure, and potentially heart disease. The U.S. Department of Agriculture defines bacon as the cured belly of a swine carcass. But in the U.K., belly is traditionally made using the back of the pig, otherwise known as the loin. This kind is fairly hard to find stateside, but it's usually labeled as back bacon. Standard U.S. bacon is instantly recognizable. It's pork belly with veins of pink meat and white fat cut crosswise into long, narrow slices. You've also got pancetta, an Italian version of streaky bacon, again made from pork belly. This variant is rolled up and sliced into thin circles. Then there's Canadian bacon, which, like British bacon, is made from pork loin. This type of bacon is pre-cooked and smoked and usually looks and tastes a little like ham. Slab bacon is a single piece of bacon with the rind left on, while fat back is a slab of fat cut from the loin and used as lard or cut into strips to be wrapped around lean roasts. Although the USDA might be something of a stickler for defining bacon as pork belly, some companies are willing to be a little bit more liberal with the term. As a result, you can find a whole bunch of non-pork bacon alternatives out there. Take Schmacon, for example. Despite looking very similar to real bacon, this variant is actually made from beef. You can also get D'Artagnan uncured, a kind of smoked duck bacon that Extra Crispy describes as featuring a little salt and some lovely fat at first, a nice toothsome quality to the meat, and then a big honking hit of duck flavor on the back end. Turkey bacon is a little more common, of course, while smoked salmon bacon is just a little more off the wall. In their taste test, Extra Crispy describes Trader Joe's salmon bacon as surprisingly meaty with a pleasant hint of smoke along with that unmistakable salmon flavor. Smoked dulse, meanwhile, has been called the bacon of the sea and is made from a wild sea vegetable similar to kelp. Traditionally, pigs have been classified one of two ways, lard pigs or bacon pigs. You can probably guess which is more relevant here. Lard breeds were used to produce, you guessed it, lard. They tended to be thicker and shorter than other pigs. They could be fattened quickly with a good corn diet, which was seen as a hugely desirable quality for pigs grown for lard. Meanwhile, bacon pigs were lean and muscular, fed on a diet of legumes, grains, turnips, and dairy byproducts. Loaded up on proteins, these pigs would grow more muscle than other breeds, making them perfect for the production of bacon. Before World War II, the only non-lard breeds of pig were the Yorkshire and Tamworth pigs. Today, however, bacon pigs are far more varied. In fact, only three traditional lard pig breeds remain, the Choctaw, the Guinea Hog, and the Mulefoot. The most popular bacon breeds, meanwhile, are the Durick, Hampshire, and Yorkshire breeds, the three of which pretty much support the entire pork industry. Most other breeds have dwindled in population, with some, such as the Mulefoot, teetering on the edge of extinction. As is the case with many animals that are farmed for consumption, some pigs live hard lives before being slaughtered for their meat. At some pig farms, pigs are reared for breeding, which means they're lined up in gestation crates and live through several cycles of pregnancy until, eventually, they are slaughtered. The piglets born from these pigs are sometimes confined in concrete pens and fattened until they reach market weight. They are then taken to be slaughtered. Of course, this isn't how it works for all pig farms. There is a way to make sure your bacon comes from a happier place. Pastured pigs live far better lives. These pigs are allowed to live in an open, free environment and can graze or forage for food to their heart's content. And it's not just the pigs who end up happier with pastured farming. These pigs are far less likely to contain the antibiotics and hormones that intensively raised pigs are fed and are raised in healthier, more hygienic conditions. This makes them healthier for you, the bacon consumer. Just be careful with bacon that comes from free-range pigs, because this can often mean only the minimum steps have been taken to meet that definition. A pig raised in a packed barn with a door at one end is not a happy pig, but you may have to ask some questions to figure out what you're getting. 
hang on before you pull a Ron Swanson. Would you like to sample our vegan bacon? 100% meatless. Yes, please. Just hear us out. So how do you make veggie or vegan bacon? Turns out it's easy. The method is simple. First, you choose your primary ingredient. Oh My Veggies suggests choosing a sufficiently porous ingredient as your base, like mushrooms, tofu, tempeh, chickpeas, coconut, carrots, or eggplant. Next, you make a marinade. For the smoky bacon flavor, use liquid smoke or smoked paprika, or both. Salty and savory flavors can be added with soy sauce, tamari, or liquid amino. Sour notes will come courtesy of vinegar. And finally, sweeter elements of the flavor can be brought in with maple syrup, agave, sugar, or brown sugar. For the best marinade, you'll want to combine all of these. Oh My Veggies suggests one part smoke, three parts sweet, four parts sour, and four parts savory and salty. Next, marinate your base ingredient, preferably up to 12 hours in the refrigerator. The longer you soak, the more intense the flavor will be. Finally, cook your bacon however you like. Bake tofu, pan-fry eggplant or tempeh, or grill your mushrooms or carrots, and voila! Tasty bacon with all of the flavor and none of the dead pig. What's not to like? Pretty much everyone has tried bologna at some point, but nobody ever really wants to know what it's made of, or how it's made. But maybe it's time that changed. From pig to plate, this is how bologna is actually made. The name bologna comes from Bologna, a large city in northern Italy where butchers produce a similar meat called mortadella, the ancient ancestor of the sandwich filling we know and love today. Mortadella has roots that go all the way back to the Roman Empire, as evidenced by certain pieces of classical Roman art and literature. For example, the Roman author Pliny the Elder once described how the Emperor Augustus, during a visit to the city, found himself particularly impressed with the taste of mortadella. The meat's main wow factor for the Romans was its saltiness. In fact, by the Middle Ages, the people whose salt cured meats such as mortadella had formed a powerful guild that had a significant financial backing in the Italian states. The guild even drove up mortadella costs by up to nine times as much as a loaf of bread. But this meat has come a long way since those days. Although American producers of bologna might also have big bucks in their bank accounts, Bologna certainly isn't the bourgeois meat it once was. The European Union is notorious for regulating the authenticity of a wide variety of food products, from cheese to champagne, and mortadella is no exception. In order for a meat product to be legally considered mortadella back in Italy, it has to meet a number of strict certifications. Namely, authentic traditional mortadella must be made using a pork sausage. No other meats can legally be used in real Italian mortadella. Additionally, authentic mortadella has pieces of fat incorporated in the sausage, giving the slices of the deli meat a characteristically mottled appearance. The ground meat and fat cubes are then combined with spices like salt and pepper and placed in a sausage casing. Unlike other cured meats like salami and prosciutto, mortadella isn't dry cured. Instead, after it's finished cooking, it's sprayed with cool water. As a result, it doesn't have the same bone-dry texture of some of the more well-known cured meats. Of course, it's abundantly clear to anyone familiar with both that American bologna isn't mortadella. It's actually more of a cousin of mortadella, and a distantly related one at that. Since U.S. laws don't strictly regulate what recipes can and can't be called bologna, America's take on the traditional Italian deli meat has taken on a much more dynamic evolution process. A lot of different brands use a variety of different meats and spice blends to produce their own variants of bologna. However, USDA regulations do actually have one strict clause that differentiates America's take on bologna from traditional mortadella. Like hot dogs, American bologna can't have small flecks of fat or spices in it. As the USDA dictates that all the meat and additives must be pulverized into tiny, unrecognizable particles. That's why America's bologna looks so very different from its speckled cousin. But beyond that one detail, it's pretty much fair game as to what can go into your bologna. Different brands and versions use all different kinds of meats, from traditional pork to beef to more off-the-wall renditions like chicken bologna. The USDA does say, however, that the label on American bologna must tell you what kind of meat you're getting. So at least there's that.
In typical American fashion, the cut of meat from which bologna is derived has changed considerably from that of its Italian ancestor. While mortadella typically uses meat from the back and cheek of the pig, bologna's makeup consists of what's known as raw skeletal muscle and other raw meat byproducts, such as the heart, kidney, or liver. Oh. <coughs> spit it out, spit it out, spit it out. Please don't swallow it. I love it. Oh my god, I'm sweating. Raw skeletal muscle is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's the muscular tissue that attaches directly to the skeleton of the pig. This cut of meat is composed mainly of muscle fibers and connective tissues and is a major component for many other highly processed meats, like hot dogs and other pre-cooked sausages. The addition of those other meat byproducts is a way for manufacturers to ensure they get the biggest bang for their buck. Adding in parts of the animal that are more difficult to sell ensures that the whole animal can be marketed. That way, they don't have to dispose of the undesirable remains. Luckily, it is possible to find out if you're getting these byproducts in your bologna. The USDA says these byproducts must be individually named in the ingredients list, as well as what species of animal they come from. Both bologna and mortadella draw on a similar flavor profile, which comes from the unique blend of spices used to flavor the two meats – coriander, celery seeds, nutmeg, black pepper, and myrtle berries. Essentially, this is the same blend of spices used in traditional blends of pickling spices, except, of course, for the myrtle berries. Small amounts of nutmeg and black pepper work to give bologna and mortadella that somewhat warm, comforting flavor. Meanwhile, coriander and celery seed add just the right touch of bitterness to take the edge off all that salt that's blended into the meat. The popular bologna manufacturer Oscar Mayer also includes ground mustard powder, beef stock, and paprika to help make their products stand out from the pack. But what really differentiates mortadella and bologna from their other lunchtime competition is the addition of myrtle berries, which gives them a particular flavor that you won't find in any other deli meats. While bologna is full of plenty of processed parts and chemical additives, myrtle berry is one of the few things you'll find on the ingredients list that is pretty much all natural. It's also one of the key ingredients that has been carried over from mortadella. The myrtle berry is indigenous to the Mediterranean and has found its way into a number of different Italian dishes beyond just mortadella. Myrtle leaves are an especially popular flavoring for roast pork dishes, so it should come as no surprise that its berries are the primary flavoring agent in mortadella, and by extension, its American cousin. In fact, the name mortadella might even be related to the Italian word for myrtle, mirto, since the spice gives the cold cut such a characteristic, semi-spicy flavor profile. Myrtle berries themselves have a slightly astringent, citrus-like flavor comparable to juniper berries and rosemary. Myrtle berries are also the main flavor component in a popular Italian liqueur known simply as Mirto. This digestif even has a flavor, according to the Huffington Post, that actually kind of tastes like bologna. Nice, huh? My bologna has a first name. It's O-S-C-A-R. Well, that's great, but that doesn't change the fact that there are 18 ingredients in a slice of Oscar Mayer's beef bologna. And that's a whole lot of ingredients for a lunch meat that started out as something relatively simple. And those ingredients aren't all meat and spices either. While things aren't all bad for the brand's cold cuts, there are a number of questionable additives, from corn syrup to a number of strange chemical compounds. Processed meats such as bologna tend to get a lot of flack for potentially having carcinogenic properties. And Oscar Mayer's bologna is no exception. In fact, one of the ingredients in the company's bologna, sodium nitrite, is a common additive in processed meats and might actually contribute to their cancer-causing properties. While sodium nitrite is an effective preservative in bologna, hot dogs, and many other meat-based products, the International Agency for the Research of Cancer has said that ingestion of nitrites is likely linked to higher rates of bowel cancer. One other risky additive in Oscar Mayer's bologna is sodium phosphate, which is generally used to cure meat products and help keep them moist. And while the FDA does consider sodium phosphate to be generally safe to eat in small quantities, it has been linked to elevated rates of mortality for those with kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. So, once you've got all your ingredients together, for better or for worse, just how do you go about making it into bologna? Well, after all of the meat and fats and spices are ground up into a fine mince, the mixture is funneled into a sausage casing. 
Traditionally, sausage casings are made from animal intestines, often the same kind of animal as the meat from which the sausage is derived. In the case of traditional mortadella, this would be pig intestine, but the jury's out for bologna. Animal intestines can be hard to come by nowadays. In fact, many sausage producers have turned to using a chemically derived sausage casing, often using compounds such as cellulose, collagen, or even plastics. But even traditional Italian mortadella is allowed to contain artificial sausage casings such as these, since it can be inconvenient and expensive to obtain the intestines necessary to create a 100% natural casing. You may find that some of the bologna you purchase in stores has what resembles a red seal around it. This is most likely an artificial casing. Most of the popular brands remove the casing before packaging their bologna. But if you're unsettled at the thought of accidentally ingesting plastic in your next bologna sandwich, then be sure to peel off that red casing if you find it. Oscar Mayer says all of their casings are plant-derived, however. So if you do happen to digest any, there's really no need to panic. As you know by now, the USDA doesn't have the same strict regulations on defining bologna that the European Union has for mortadella. But there is one particularly interesting regulation that really separates American bologna from its Italian cousin. It's essentially mandated by law that bologna be made using a meat batter rather than finely ground up or minced meat. This is why bologna and mortadella look so different, despite having similar flavor profiles. While the base of mortadella is a rather heterogeneous blend of meat, fat, and spices, all those components must be reduced to particles when making bologna in America. Meat batters have a fluid, homogeneous consistency that's created by the emulsion of animal fats and a liquid, while the protein in the meat serves to combine the two liquids into a stable mixture. In order to do this effectively, the proteins in the meat must be ground down to very fine particles, and manufacturers must be very careful about the amount of salt and acidic ingredients they add to the mixture. Otherwise, they risk inadvertently destabilizing the batter. Once the bologna batter has been made, it's funneled into those casings. I measure out the dry ingredients, I mix in the slurry real slow, and load them all into the extruder. After the meat and spice emulsion has been transferred to its casing, it's then cooked. This process can differ depending on the brand and variant of bologna, and American bologna is often cooked differently from Italian mortadella. According to the European Union's regulations on producing authentic mortadella, the Italian product is slow cooked in a warm room for a few hours to a full day, depending on the size of the sausages being cooked. The mortadella making process features dry air heaters that heat up the internal temperature of the sausage to around 158 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the cooking process is complete, it's sprayed with cool water and cooled down to stabilize the product before packaging. In the United States, bologna manufacturers have two options for finishing their bologna products. According to USDA regulations, bologna is a member of a family of processed meats called frankfurters, you know, like hot dogs, which can be either cooked or smoked. Because of this, many bologna brands feature a smoky flavor comparable to bacon. This, of course, is just another factor that differentiates the flavor profile of American bologna from the more highbrow Italian product. For all of the scary headlines, most of us don't fully understand how hot dogs are manufactured. Or maybe we don't really want to know. But we took a look at the process from start to finish and were surprised by what we found. Join us as we take a detailed look at how hot dogs are really made. Whether you choose pork, beef, or chicken hot dogs, chances are they're made up of a bunch of different animal parts that most wouldn't consider prime cuts. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations defines those as the raw meat materials used for pre-cooked cooked products are lower-grade muscle trimmings, fatty tissues, head meat, animal feet, animal skin, blood, liver, and other edible slaughter byproducts. Sure, the term slaughter byproducts may not exactly whet your appetite, but making hot dogs means making sure that no parts of the animals we raise and systematically kill go to waste. And that's a concept that most of us can get behind. The trimmings, along with assorted byproducts and variety meats, are loaded into giant meat grinders, similar to the ones you've seen the butcher using to grind hamburger at the grocery store. All of those different animal parts are finely ground at this stage to form a sort of loose, heavily textured meat mashup. 
After the ground hot dog mixture has been appropriately seasoned and had all the preservatives and bacteria-inhibiting agents added, it's time for the really gross part. For many, this is the stage of the hot dog making process that is accompanied by visuals that will haunt your dreams. The entire mixture is blended with water until it is smooth, resulting in a pale pink meat mixture that's roughly the color and consistency of bad buffet restaurant soft serve ice cream. The meat mixture is typically pureed again at this stage, and the excess air in the raw hot dog batter is vacuumed out of the meat in order to make the finished hot dog more dense and give it a firmer texture. From there, it's on to the casing machines to give the hot dogs their familiar shape that's perfect for buns. The biggest retail hot dog brands in the United States tend to be skinless, though natural cased hot dogs are growing in popularity. But whether they end up on supermarket shelves in a casing or not, casing the meat puree is still a big step in the manufacturing process. It's what gives hot dogs their signature shape. After all that pink meat batter passes inspection, it is pumped into an automatic stuffing and linking machine. The meat is blasted at high pressure into tube-shaped cellulose casings made from synthetic material, which are then twisted at precise intervals to produce a long string of equally sized hot dogs. The production rate of these machines is incredibly fast. In fact, it takes just 35 seconds to produce a chain of hot dogs so long it would span the length of a soccer field. Twice. After being stuffed into their casings, the hot dog strands are loaded onto giant conveyor racks and rolled through a shower of liquid smoke before moving into an oven with several cooking zones. Here they are thoroughly cooked under controlled temperature and humidity conditions, and all that liquid smoke has a chance to permeate the casing for an added boost of flavor while they bake. After the cooking process is complete, the fresh-from-the-oven hot dogs get one more shower, this time with cold salt water, which helps to quickly drop their temperature and get them ready for packaging. After cooking and cooling, the hot dog links are moved via conveyor to an automatic peeling machine to strip them of their cellulose casings. Once they hit the peeler, the cellulose casings are sliced open with a tiny knife, and then the hot dogs are blasted with a burst of high-pressure steam, which blows off the casing and leaves just the bare naked hot dog remaining. A typical hot dog peeling machine can process upwards of 700 hot dogs per minute, or about 11 and a half hot dogs per second, shooting them rapid fire through the other side of the peeling machine like a fire hose. Next, the nearly finished hot dogs move along a conveyor belt where they receive a final inspection. The hot dogs get a quality control check to ensure they're the proper weight, and only tubed meat that could be considered flawless makes it through these final quality control checks before being passed off for packaging. Of course, flawless is a term that we use somewhat loosely now that we know what's inside of them. Hot dogs which are damaged, broken, or torn at any point in the process are pulled from the line and prevented from entering the packaging process, ensuring that every package of hot dogs you crack open for a backyard barbecue is consistent, perfect, and ready to hit the grill. Or your person. I like getting hit with hot dogs. It don't bother me none. <laughs> I guess I'm lucky it wasn't hot chili day today. After the cellulose casings are removed and the finished hot dogs receive a final quality control check, the hot dogs make their way to the packaging machinery. Here, hot dogs are lined up on sheets of plastic film printed with all of the graphics and marketing claptrap commonly found on supermarket dogs. The film is folded over and vacuum sealed to preserve the hot dog's flavor and extend their shelf life, and then transported to a stamping machine which prints a freshness date on each individual package. After packaging, the finished hot dogs are boxed and shipped in refrigerated trucks to supermarkets to be loaded into shopping carts and shoved down the gullets of people nationwide. Who's hungry? If that's how they make hot dogs, I don't want one. I'm good. Have you ever wondered how mayonnaise is made or how it got its name? Keep watching to find out all the deets on how to make mayo at home, plus the international feud over where this popular condiment originated. Let's start with the simple stuff. If you're not big on buying your mayo off the grocery store shelf, or if you just like trying your hand at new recipes, you can absolutely make your own mayonnaise. All you need to make a basic homemade mayonnaise is a couple of egg yolks, some mixed oils, an acidic ingredient such as vinegar or lemon juice, and a little salt. That's it. The method is just as simple. Whisk the egg yolks in a bowl, then slowly add about half the oil while still whisking, until the mixture has thickened. 
Then whisk in a little vinegar or lemon juice and gradually add the remaining oil, whisking the whole time. Season with the salt, add as much more of the acid as you need, then store in the refrigerator for use. Celebrity chef Jamie Oliver suggests using a little Dijon mustard, but it really is up to you. Experiment, have fun with it, and see what you can come up with, because there's so much you can do with mayonnaise. And here's the extra mayonnaise you ordered. Yum, yum. Enjoy. Mm, this is the best stuff. It might seem like cooking wizardry, but mayonnaise comes about from all that whisking because of a very specific chemical process emulsification. You see, some liquids aren't supposed to be mixed together, and oil and vinegar are just two of these types of liquids. And if you stop whisking, they'll quickly separate. That's where the egg comes in. Egg yolk contains lecithin, which is a fat emulsifier. Adding it to the mixture of oil and vinegar creates what's known as a colloid, which is a substance that consists of tiny particles, which are slightly larger than atomic molecules, from one substance. In this case, the mixture of vinegar and oil spread out through a second substance. That's your egg yolk. Because the particles do not settle, they can't separate out and instead stay bonded together. Essentially, adding the egg yolk emulsifier to the mixture of oil and vinegar binds them together and prevents the mix from separating, creating, in the end, mayonnaise. Think of it like glue, but much tastier. So now you know how to make mayonnaise at home. But what about the big brands? After all, major food corporations aren't going to have chefs hand-whisking their mayo in a quaint country kitchen, much as they'd probably like to market it that way. No, step into the factories and you'll find a rather more impressive, if familiar, operation taking place. In the United States, the FDA regulates that mayonnaise must contain 65% oil in its recipe, as well as vinegar, egg, or egg yolk. You can throw in almost anything else, but you've got to have those ingredients to be counted as mayo. Strangely enough, turmeric and saffron are out as ingredients, since they yellow the mayonnaise and could give consumers the impression it contains more egg yolks. During the process itself, a continuous blending system, much like whisking, is used to sustain the emulsification of the key ingredients. The mixture of vinegar and oil is pushed through a series of pumps to and from large cavities. Finally, the mayonnaise is pumped down to a bottling station, and measured amounts are poured into the jars. Some are given taste tests for quality control, and the rest are shipped off to stores. Any chef worth their egg yolk will tell you that a recipe is only as good as its ingredients. And it goes without saying that good eggs will go a long way toward giving you good mayo. Bad eggs, however, or poor conditions for the chickens laying them, will give you bad mayo, and maybe even a guilty conscience to boot. And while some mayonnaise producers have committed to slightly improving standards for their chickens, there's still a long way to go in that particular field. If you wanted to, you could always opt for a vegan mayo and cut out the animal involvement altogether. There are plenty of vegan-friendly choices on the market. But according to the FDA, mayonnaise made without eggs isn't mayonnaise at all. Instead, it's a mayo-like dressing or a sauce. Though there's nothing to stop you from using it like you would a mayonnaise. Let's say you do want to save a little time and opt for a big brand mayo for your kitchen at home. Who do you go for? The choices are many, and if you're already a big mayonnaise eater, then the idea of moving out of your mayonnaise-based comfort zone might not seem too appealing. But don't dismiss the idea too readily. The folks over at Serious Eats performed a taste test of the major brands in early 2019 that included Dukes, Kraft, Whole Food 365, Miracle Whip – yeah, we know, but they included it for variety's sake – Trader Joe's, Hellman's, Best Foods, and Blue Plate. Each was tasted plain, then with some blanched asparagus, then added into a potato salad. The tasters were asked to rank each mayonnaise in terms of sweetness, tanginess, and overall preference, as well as provide written feedback. The result? Trader Joe's proved the sweetest, Cupy the most tangy, and Kraft won overall. According to the taste testers, Kraft's mayo was the brightest, freshest, and most interesting of the lot. Velvety, smooth mayo. Kraft mayo. The mayo of mayonnaise. 
It was lauded particularly for its onion, garlic, and paprika flavor. Duke's and Trader Joe's came in tied at second, while Hellman's took third. Down at the bottom, surprising nobody, was Miracle Whip, which contains not just egg, oil, and vinegar, but also fructose corn syrup, and turned out to be, quote, excessively cloying and unnatural tasting. Seems like everyone's on a health kick, and a little wholesome eating never hurt anyone. So you'd be forgiven for balking at the fatty contents of mayonnaise and opting for something better for you instead. Of course, you might also opt for low-fat mayo. The question is, should you? And if so, which is best? Time for another taste test. According to WebMD, mayonnaise branded as light tends to use water as the main ingredient rather than oil, while fat-free mayo uses water, sugar, and modified food starch. WebMD's testers preferred Hellman's mayonnaise dressing with extra virgin olive oil as a light mayo, on the basis that it tastes like regular mayonnaise and uses the same ingredients used in the homemade stuff. If you're making it at home, using water is one option to stay healthy, but making your mayonnaise with egg whites is another. In that case, you'll get all the nutrients of egg whites, including vitamin B, potassium, and protein without any of the fat of the egg yolk. Of course, the thing you're most likely wanting to do with your mayonnaise recipe is spice it up with some extra ingredients. And you wouldn't be the first to do so either. Nowadays, there are as many varieties of mayonnaise as there are ingredients under the sun. If you've scoured online for mayo recipes, you're bound to have come across a few special kinds, some of which are arguably better than the cool white original. Some mayonnaise varieties you might come across include herb-based mayos, such as basil, dill, chive, or ranch mayo, hot mayos such as chipotle, peppercorn, kimchi, or wasabi, umami flavors such as blue cheese, parmesan, garlic, or pecan, smoky mayos like bacon, smoked paprika, or smoked cheese, other miscellaneous varieties such as sun-dried tomato, teriyaki, red pepper, or curry, or even sweet mayos like raspberry, apple, or cranberry. The possibilities are endless, and the menu is only limited by your imagination. We're still holding out for ice cream mayo. On second thoughts, maybe not. And just like how you can influence mayonnaise with other ingredients, so too can you use mayonnaise to influence other sauces. In fact, mayonnaise is a vital component of many famous sauces, proving that this criminally underrated condiment has been hauling its culinary weight far more quietly and effectively than that red stuff people keep slathering over their food. Some sauces that involve mayonnaise include ranch dressing, which is made from mayo, sour cream, and minced onions, remoulade, a kind of mayonnaise and mustard sauce that includes gherkin pickles, capers, parsley, chervil, tarragon, and occasionally anchovies. Movies. Tartar sauce, which is mayonnaise with pickles, onion, capers, olives, and crushed egg. Honey mustard dressing, which throws brown sugar, lemon juice, and mustard into the equation. And Thousand Island dressing, which is made from mayo, tomato sauce, sweet pickles, and herbs. So if you feel like you've experimented as much as you like with new mayos, why not try messing around with mayo as a base for a new condiment or sauce? You never know what you might invent. You've probably heard of aioli. Some very enthusiastic person has probably told you about it. He was all over the map. He spent 20 minutes talking about aioli. Unless you know any better, there's also a good chance you use the term more or less interchangeably with mayonnaise. But the truth is, there are a few crucial differences between them. For one, aioli very specifically comes from the region of Provence in France, and isn't made with a blender or a whisk. Instead, aioli is made by pasting garlic with a mortar and pestle, before adding to a combination of egg yolk, lemon juice, mustard, and olive oil. And while mayonnaise is an incredibly versatile sauce, sauce used in all kinds of ways, aioli is used pretty much exclusively as a dip, usually for shellfish, boiled eggs, or vegetable crudite. There are similarities, though. They're both emulsions and work off the same chemical process as each other. Some Mediterranean recipes insist that aioli is made simply with olive oil, mashed garlic, and salt, foregoing the use of acid or egg yolk. Aioli basically means garlic mayonnaise, and the terms have become practically synonymous. 
Considering how critical mayonnaise's impact on modern cooking has been, it should come as little surprise that the sauce has a long and storied history, too. And although it's possible to trace mayo's past over the last few centuries, there is some disagreement as to where and when it actually originated. More specifically, there's a great deal of bad blood between Spain and France over who actually invented mayonnaise. One origin story suggests that mayonnaise was invented in 1756 during the siege of Port Mahon on the island of Menorca. The personal chef of the Duc de Richelieu, who led the French, found the island lacked the cream he was looking to use in a dish, and invented an early version of mayonnaise in its place. Food writer Tom Neelan, however, has suggested the Spanish view that they invented mayonnaise is accurate. He said, The fact that mayo doesn't show up in any of the initial 17th century French recipe collections does seem to confirm that the French didn't have the technology for mayonnaise until the 18th century. Mayonnaise historian Andrew Smith, on the other hand, said, All of the early recipes say French. I believe it. Oat cuisine pioneer Antoine Carême claimed the word mayonnaise derives from the French verb manier, which means to stir. It could also be a corruption of the word moyonnaise, a word derived from the old French word moyu, which means egg yolk. And then you've got the theories that the word derives from bayonnaise, based off the town of Bayonne in southern France. This notion goes off the assumption that the thick French accent gradually eroded that B to an M over time, and bayonnaise eventually became mayonnaise. Bon Appetit believes aioli is the real source of the mayonnaise sauce, and that mayonnaise was a development on the original recipe of garlic and oil. They note that Bayonne and Mayon both sit at opposite sides of the culinary regions in which aioli originated, regions that also share French and Spanish linguistic traditions. It's from these regions, they say, that mayonnaise, too, almost certainly came. Sadly, however, the specifics appear to have been lost to time. There's a lot more to making canned corned beef than just dumping some meat in a can. From choosing the cut of meat to adding preservatives to sterilizing the can, this is all that goes into it. There are a few different ways to make canned corned beef. Science Direct describes one method in which the meat is canned without being cooked or cured. More commonly, though, it's pre-cooked and cured before going through the canning process. Delighted Cooking confirms that this is the case with most canned corned beef products. This method is sometimes called hot packing in the canning community, according to Wild Heaven Farms. While most consider beef safe to be canned raw, also known as raw packing, hot packing has its benefits. For one, hot packing can ensure that meat will keep its shape. This also prevents it from sticking to the sides of the can, which is definitely handy from a consumer perspective. Once it comes out of the can, it's preferable that canned corned beef stays formed into a solid block, which enables it to be sliced or diced for preparation. Cooking canned meat first helps to make it into a ready-to-eat final product. The name corned beef doesn't actually refer to corn, the grain. Instead, the name comes from the big pieces of salt added to the meat. Smithsonian Magazine explains that these pieces of salt were historically roughly the size of corn kernels. Around the 1600s, the British came up with the name corned beef to refer to beef cured using these kernel-sized pieces of salt. Although you may not see these large pieces of salt in your can of corned beef, salt is still a primary ingredient. However, since the meat in canned corned beef is usually cooked before canning, salt isn't the only thing helping with preservation. According to one Quora user who claimed to have worked for a canned corned beef processing plant, salt is added after the meat is cooked. This helps manufacturers to more easily obtain a concentrated meat product. The large grains of salt added after cooking also provide flavor to the final product. How is that? Salty. Canned corned beef falls under the category of processed meats in a few different ways. The first reason it's processed, according to PBS, is simply by virtue of it being canned. Second, as meat science explains, processed meat can also refer to cuts that are cured or smoked, such as sliced ham, Canadian bacon, pastrami, and others, corned beef among them. Third, because canned corned beef is also refined into smaller pieces during production, it's considered processed by that definition. The meat within a can of corned beef may start in large pieces, but after cooking and salting, its shape starts to change. During this stage of the production process, canned corned beef must be minced or ground up before getting packed and shaped within cans. For this reason, it qualifies as a type of restructured meat. Meat science defines that term as meat made from flaked, ground, or sectioned beef or pork, which is shaped into roasts, steaks, or loaves. No matter what method is used to break down the canned corned beef, it must also be chopped up to take on a new shape. 
When fresh corned beef, not the canned stuff, is being made, a few spices are usually added. Seasonings including black pepper, coriander, allspice, dill seeds, and mustard seeds are used to flavor the meat, giving dishes such as corned beef and cabbage their flavor. But canned corned beef is different. Check the ingredients list of cans of Hereford or Palm canned corned beef, and the only seasonings listed are salt and sugar. And the salt serves more as a preservative than a seasoning. Sugar is added to aid in the preservation process, as well as cancel out some of the taste from all the sodium, according to Meat Science. Another preservative you'll often find listed is sodium nitrate. It's an ingredient in Iberia and Excelsior's canned corned beef. This ingredient gives the meat a pinkish color, which canned corned beef is known for having. It also extends its shelf life and improves the flavor. According to WebMD, there are some health concerns surrounding sodium nitrate involving its link to diabetes and heart disease. Some sources recommend against consuming too much of it. The BBC explains that sodium nitrate is added to canned meat during the middle of its production process when a preserving liquid made of salt, water, and sodium nitrate is usually mixed in. Then the mixture is injected into various parts of the meat. The injection, as well as the addition of water, helps to ensure that the whole meat product will be preserved. The cut of beef chosen for the tinned product isn't the same as what you'd buy at a deli counter to make homemade corned beef. As Science Direct explains, traditional corned beef uses brisket, which comes from the cow's chest area, but canned corned beef isn't always made from brisket. No brisket! Tough, lean cuts of meat, such as round steaks, chuck roasts, or ribs, work best for canning. According to Very Meaty, canning meat also requires that as much fat as possible be removed. If too much fat is left in, it can cause multiple issues, including rancidity, sealing, and heat penetration. This is why canned corned beef makers opt for leaner cuts that have less fat. Brisket can opt to be pretty fatty, so that's why canners don't always use it. After the corned beef is packed into cans, another step is sometimes employed. Factories may sterilize the meat-filled cans. As Britannica explains, these sterilization processes usually involve bringing the cans to a certain temperature to prevent bacteria, such as the one that causes botulism from forming. To achieve sterilization, corned beef cans should be brought above boiling temperature, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. During this process, containers of canned corned beef are placed inside a pressure cooker, then covered in hot steam, allowing both the food and its container to be sterilized simultaneously, Science Direct explains. Not only does this process sterilize the can, but also tenderizes the meat inside in a short amount of time. After the cans are finished sterilizing, they'll be removed from the pressure cooker, then set aside to dry off and cool down. After the canned corned beef is cooked, ground into smaller pieces, and then mixed with sodium nitrate, salt, and sugar, it's finally time to be packed into cans. This process is partially or completely automated in the factories where canned meats are made. At Keystone Meats, for example, a machine helps guide the meat into the individual cans. Then, the cans are led down a conveyor belt where lids are sealed onto the cans. The shape of the cans used can vary, and many brands of canned corned beef are known for having a unique can shape. Just look at the rectangular containers that Hormel's canned corned beef comes in. As it turns out, there are multiple reasons for this shape. According to The Guardian, the shape helps to make the canned corned beef easily sliceable for adding to sandwiches or diceable for adding to a corned beef hash. In addition, these cans lack a seam, allowing customers to slide out the entire block of meat all at one time. Historically, the shape also has ties to what was the easiest shape to store and transport in large amounts since canned corned beef has roots as a war ration. The steps of the canned corned beef production process are focused on making the meat survive in a can as long as possible. The steps involved are pretty laborious because cooked beef only lasts three to four days in the fridge, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. However, canned corned beef will last much longer. According to Very Meaty, unopened cans will last three to five years on the shelf. Once opened, though, canned corned beef's days are numbered. Leftovers will only last three to four days in the fridge. It's best to keep it stored in a glass or plastic container. If you opt to put your leftovers into the freezer, corned beef out of a can will last around three months, according to Still Tasty. Survival Freedom recommends putting your leftover canned corned beef into freezer-safe storage bags. Canned corned beef is produced so that it is ready to eat right away. And now, who's ready to eat my meat? It's not necessary to cook the meat before eating it, but before you start chowing down, you may find that just getting the can open comes with some unique challenges. Square cans of corned beef must be opened with a key. Luckily, this key comes attached to each can. Following the instructions carefully will best ensure your can gets opened. Instructables advises that you remove the key and find where a small metal tab protrudes from the side of the can. 
Next, place the tab through a hole in the long part of the key. Finally, rotate the key around the side of the can, bringing the tab with it. This will create a cut in the can's side that runs along the entire edge. When you're finished, the entire top of the can can be removed, exposing part of the inner brick of meat. If eating the meat out of the can with a fork isn't for you, there are plenty of ways to use the meat in recipes. Yummy recommends going light on the salt when using corned beef in cooking. Some ways to eat canned corned beef include corned beef hash with eggs, a quiche, or egg rolls. Despite the convenience of canned corned beef, it's not considered especially healthy. According to Very Meaty, canned corned beef is high in sodium, as you might expect given how important salt is in the production process. It's also pretty high in fat and cholesterol. It's been linked to illnesses like heart disease and cancer. However, some potential nutritional benefits come with eating canned corned beef. It typically has no carbohydrates, and each serving is high in protein. Ox and Palm brand corned beef, for example, has 11 grams of protein per serving. The Mayo Clinic suggests that a 165-pound person should consume about 60 grams of protein per day. So a serving of corned beef is a good start toward that goal. How many dolphins died to get your tuna in a can? The answer isn't zero. There's a lot more drama behind your tuna sandwich than you thought. When it comes to different types of tuna you can find, you are likely to immediately think of light or white tuna. That's because this is one of the clearer distinctions you'll notice in the grocery store aisle. According to Starkist, light tuna comes from skipjack and yellowfin and is characterized by a tannish pinkish color, soft texture, and a flavor akin to chicken thighs. On the other hand, white tuna can only be made from albacore. Contrary to what its name suggests, white tuna appears light pink and has a firmer texture and a milder flavor comparable to chicken breasts. Of the two, white tuna has a slightly higher fat content and thus higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids. There are other species of tuna that, although not primarily earmarked for canning, are worth noting. Among these are bluefin tuna. As the most expensive tuna species, bluefin tuna's lifespan can go 20 years. You'd be hard-pressed to find it served any other way but in sashimi and sushi. If I were a lion and you were a tuna, I would swim out in the middle of the ocean and freaking eat you! Pole and line fishing, as well as hand lining, what fishermen do during surface trolling, are the most ecological fishing methods. Although they seem pretty straightforward, they do require a lot of equipment. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, there is a sequence of four main operations during fishing. To make things even more complicated, each kind comes with its own unique set of tools needed to do the job. The first method involves baiting hooks, which require nets and light attraction devices for small fish and squids that will be used as bait. Frozen bait is sometimes also used, though it may not be as effective. The second focuses on school locations, which requires acoustic instruments like an echo sounder. The third method demands setting hand lines, which requires lines of varying lengths and hooks. Finally, the fourth tuna wrangling method is landing catch, where fishing lures are placed under a cover that's been sprayed with undercover or boxes with ice. In cases where the tuna that's been caught is large, it must be kept in an individual box with ice. What's more, the lines must also be strong enough to not only carry the fish, but to manage its escape attempts. Some of the most popular tuna fishing methods include pole and line fishing, surface trolling, long line fishing, and purse seine fishing. Pole and line fishing uses handheld poles with short lines and baited hooks to catch tuna specifically where a school has been located. Surface trolling is when a boat slowly drags lured poles and lines across the ocean's surface. Any tuna that is caught is quickly reeled in and unhooked by the fishermen aboard before the line is placed back in. While pole and line fishing, along with trolling, are specifically aimed at catching tuna, long line, purse sign fishing, and gill nets are less precise. Other animals are easily caught up in these latter methods, which are exceptionally harmful to the environment. While issues with bycatch center on dolphins, it is now clear that these methods can harm other species, including turtles, swordfish, and young tuna that should not be caught nor kept. It's brook trout. Hope you like fish. I love it. <coughs> Thanks. The International Seafood Sustainability Foundation reported that 64% of shark catches in the Indian Ocean can be attributed to gillnet fishing. As such, it's important to check that the tuna you consume has been caught using ecologically sound methods. 
Food source information says that after tuna has been caught, hopefully using ecological and sustainable methods, and stored cold, it is thawed in water tanks, sorted according to size, and then pre-cooked in order to remove any unwanted oils. This process of pre-cooking can last anywhere between 45 minutes and 3 hours. Next, the tuna is left to cool, then stripped of bones and skins before the meat is separated into light and red categories. Light meat, also referred to as loins, is what's used for canning, while red meat is often used to make pet food. The loins are cleaned in preparation for canning. During the canning process, the tuna, along with cans, are washed, cooked and sterilised. This is done to make sure that any live bacteria that may still be present inside the sealed cans is completely removed. They are then left to cool before being labelled and assessed for leakage or contamination, before they're declared ready for shipping and retail. For most people, the choice between water-packed and oil-packed tuna comes down to a matter of taste, perceived healthiness or both. According to Livestrong, water-packed tuna contains 66 calories per serving compared to the 145 calories typical of oil-packed tuna. So, if caloric intake is your biggest concern, water-packed could be the best way to go. One of the greatest benefits of tuna is its richness as a source of omega-3 fatty acids. Water-packed tuna reportedly trumps the oil-packed variety in this regard, but much of that nutrient could be in the oil. According to Clean Plates, one way to get the most out of that omega-3 fatty acid-rich oil is to use it. Deploy it as an ingredient in your homemade salad dressings, for instance, or make mayo from scratch. Oil-packed tuna also trumps water-packed when it comes to selenium and vitamin D. While half a cup of oil-packed tuna contains 55.5 micrograms of selenium, which supports the body by lowering oxidative stress and inflammation while aiding immune and thyroid function, according to Healthline, the same amount of water-packed tuna contains 48.7 micrograms. These same amounts of oil and water-packed tuna also contain 4.9 micrograms and 0.83 micrograms of vitamin D, respectively. Ultimately, whichever one you choose will come with its own benefits and drawbacks compared to the other. What really matters is that you enjoy your choice. The phrase packed in water is pretty straightforward. However, different types of vegetable oil can be used to make oil-packed tuna such as soybean, sunflower and canola oil, just as long as it's not olive oil. Tuna packed in olive oil will usually be specified as such on the packaging. Once the above distinctions are made, other seasonings and flavourings can be added to the mix. Among these are spices, along with extracts and oils that can include salt, lemon flavouring and garlic. Sleep well, Miss Lucy. The garlic will protect you. Vegetable broths are also a feature here, though they must contain at least two vegetables from a specific list, such as beans, carrots, cabbage, celery or bell peppers. Surprisingly enough, vegetable oil can also be a flavouring in water-packed tuna. However, it can only make up 5% of the total can contents in order for it to qualify as water-packed. In cases where the tuna is smoked, similarly to olive oil-packed tuna, it will be marked accordingly. The safety of canned foods is paramount with any type of food. Canned tuna is no exception. Given the rigorous sterilization processes used during canning, sealed tuna cans are about as safe from foodborne disease as a food can be, per food source information. This means that any dates regarding to a can's best buy or sell by deadlines are more about the quality of the tuna rather than its safety. For home canning, however, food safety is dependent on how closely the canner follows canning and sterilization guidelines. According to the National Fisheries Institute, you can help maintain the quality of your canned tuna by storing the cans at room temperature and keeping them off the floor, like on a pantry shelf with other canned or jarred goods. Try placing older cans in front of newer ones in your pantry in order to remind yourself to use the older ones first. If you're ever in any doubt about canned tuna or any other foods in your kitchen, you can always access the USDA Guide to Food Safety and Handling to be extra sure before whipping up your next amazing tuna salad. Tuna salad sandwiches, tuna melts and tuna salads. These are the usual suspects you'll find at the table when you catch a whiff of canned tuna. However, there are plenty of ways to spice up your tuna salad and a lot of it comes down to your sense of taste. Jesus, it's like he's staring back at you. No, 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 no. What? Staring. Sensing. 
For instance, you can give it a hit of warmth with a curry powder blend containing curry leaf, turmeric, cardamom and cumin, for instance. You can also sample the sweetness of dill or the zesty kick of lemon pepper. If you don't have lemon pepper on hand, you can easily make your own by grinding up sea salt, pepper and lemon zest. According to Greatest, you can also add a bit of razzle to your tuna salad by foregoing the traditional mayo entirely and instead adding dressing, or mustard, Greek yogurt or sour cream, or hummus. Consider adding texture with chopped nuts, seeds and crunchy fruits such as pears and vegetables. Other creative ways of preparing your canned tuna include using it in a variety of pastas, white bean soups, tuna cakes or burgers, and incorporating it in a tonato sauce for bread or appetizers. The possibilities here are practically endless. Tuna stir-fry anyone? According to BBC Good Food, 100 grams of canned tuna contains about the same nutrients as the same weight of fresh tuna. For starters, you'll get about 24.9 grams of protein from a 100-gram can of tuna. It's also a valuable source of amino acids, B vitamins, calcium, magnesium and vitamin D. These help to protect you from heart disease and support the health of your skin, bones and brain. When it's packed in brine or water, canned tuna is also low in fat. Combined with its high protein content, this nutrition profile can aid in weight management. While canned tuna does boast an impressive profile of health benefits, moderation is still key. Per eat this, not that, one can of tuna contains about a quarter of one's daily recommended amount of sodium. Your body needs sodium to support the contraction and relaxation of muscle, regulate your balance of water and minerals, and maintain nerve function, according to Harvard School of Public Health. However, when sodium is consumed in high quantities, it can lead to bloating and, over the long term, can increase your risk of heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure. We cannot consider the health benefits of tuna without considering the potential dangers of mercury. This potential contaminant is another reason why moderation is key when it comes to eating tuna. According to Healthline, mercury seeps into marine life through natural and man-made industrial processes that emit mercury into the atmosphere and ocean water. Because tuna feeds on other, smaller fish that already contain mercury, it ends up collecting more of this heavy metal than many other seafood animals, a persistent issue for large, predatory, ocean-going fish. For instance, 85 grams of light tuna can contain a mercury concentration of about 10.71 micrograms, while the same amount of albacore tuna can contain about 29.75 micrograms. Given that the EPA advises that you only consume a maximum of 0.045 micrograms of mercury per pound of body weight in a day, according to Healthline, one 85-gram serving of albacore tuna contains a serious dose of the stuff. Consuming more of this toxin than your body can handle will potentially result in mercury poisoning. Per vice, symptoms of milder cases of mercury poisoning include colouring in the cheeks, swelling, itching, burning or even feeling like insects are crawling under the skin. More serious cases are signified by heightened blood pressure, lowered cognitive function and lung, kidney and visual impairments. In 2019, the BBC reported that Japanese sushi boss and self-proclaimed tuna king Kiyoshi Kimura paid $3.1 million for a 612-pound bluefin tuna at Tokyo's first fish market auction of the year. Sold to you. Thank you so much, sir. At the time, Kimura had already been the highest bidder for seven out of eight years. This time, he paid more than twice his already mind-boggling 2013 bid of $1.4 million. Such a high bid for the bluefin, which is listed as an endangered species by the World Wildlife Fund, was reportedly a status symbol, given how low bluefin catches had been in the previous year. According to Rarist, there are several other expensive tuners that deserve mention. Firstly, sashimi-grade albacore tuna can be served as a mid-range luxury dish, with fillets as big as £10 going for $195. Sashimi-grade albacore is exceptionally rare, as it's of such high quality that it can be eaten raw. Although like lower grades of albacore, yellowfin tuna is also commonly canned, high-quality varieties of this tuna can go $30 per pound, with maximum weights of up to £400. Have you ever wondered what the heck goes into making bourbon? What's the process behind those rich notes of vanilla, caramel, oak, or cedar? Bourbon lovers everywhere, keep watching! 
So let's open that bottle of liquor. Hey, bourbon, take me home. Before you can make bourbon, it's important to understand what a bourbon is and what a bourbon is not. A whiskey must meet very strict guidelines in order to be considered a bourbon. And yes, those guidelines go beyond merely being made in Kentucky. Though you'll find a lot of bourbon experts will fight on that rule, with the Bluegrass State residents remaining firmly on the side of all bourbon must be made in Kentucky, whereas everyone else takes a broader approach to the definition. Smithsonian Magazine says, according to the experts, bourbon distilling isn't technically limited to Kentucky. Instead, a bourbon must fall under six guidelines. First, it has to be made in the United States, anywhere in the United States. Secondly, it must be aged in new charred white oak barrels. Third, it must be at least 51% corn. Fourth and fifth, it must be distilled at less than 160 proof and barreled at less than 125 proof. Lastly, there cannot be any additional coloring or flavoring added. For relaxing times, make it Centauri time. Each whiskey, including bourbons, starts with a mash bill, which is basically the master distiller's recipe for that particular whiskey. It tells the distiller exactly what grains need to go into the whiskey from the start in what ratios. However, remember that in order for a whiskey to be a bourbon, at least 51% of that grain ratio must be made up of corn. Other grains that can be used include malted barley, rye, and wheat. The ratios of each impact the taste of the final product. As Southern Distilling Company notes, a whiskey with more corn will have almost a syrupy flavor, while rye-heavy whiskies are more savory. Bourbons with a heavy portion of malted barley will typically taste maltier and toffee-esque, while bourbons with a heavy amount of wheat will taste clean with a soft, sweet undertone. The final ratio and mash bill depend entirely on the individual distiller. The only rule, again, is that they include at least 51% corn. So then, how do you go about actually creating the bourbon mash? According to Masterclass, the correct portions of grain are combined and then added to water and yeast, typically in a very large vat. The mixture is heated and stirred, creating the bourbon mash. But even at this point in the process, careful consideration is taken when choosing the yeast and even the water, as both impact the final product. According to VinePair, distillers will either use their own proprietary strain of live culture yeast that they've been growing at their distillery for decades, or or they'll purchase yeast from a dedicated producer. In other words, they're not going to the grocery store and picking up a packet of dried yeast like you'd use for baking. Many distillers also say that limestone water is necessary for bourbon making. And it just so happens that limestone water is abundant in Kentucky. Then again, turning a what if into a that's it can be pretty tasty. Yes, sir. After the bourbon mash is created via the perfect quantities of grains as well as the right yeast and water, it's left to ferment. The fermentation process doesn't take long. Masterclass says from one to two weeks, but other distillers are finished with fermentation in as little as three days. The fermentation process allows for all of the ingredients to break down on a chemical level, creating alcohol. Often, the distiller will add more yeast and sour mash around this time. The sour mash is a mash liquid that's been left over from a previous batch of bourbon mash and helps the new mash reach the correct pH levels. Think of it as similar to a sourdough starter or kombucha scoby. You need a little bit of something old to make something new. The tradition of using sour mash came about in the 1800s to help distillers produce a consistent product over multiple batches. Today, every major U.S. whiskey distillery uses the sour mash process, but it's not entirely necessary to create a bourbon, and it is possible to find some micro distillers who do not, according to Whiskey Magazine. As the whiskey professor explains, there are two separate distilling processes that the fermented mixture must go through before barreling. The first distillation process happens before the liquids and solids are separated. Once the mash is fermented and has a low alcohol content, it's known as distiller's beer. It's sent into a still where it's heated, making the alcohol vapors rise. These vapors travel through a tube that condenses the vapors, turning them back into liquid. This higher-proof liquid is 
preserved and sent on to the second distillation process in a doubler, and the proof increases even further. This liquid is almost ready for barreling and can be held in a retention tank until that time. But what about all those liquids and solids that the vaporized alcohol left behind? After fermentation and one round of distillation are complete, the remaining mixture is strained, separating the liquids and solids. The liquid can be used as that sour mash that's added to new mash later, but the solids have a very different destination. While some distillers may toss the solids, known as distiller's grain, others will ship the grain to farms, where it's used as livestock feed. While that may seem a little odd and possibly harmful to the chicken and cows for which the feed is intended. After all, this grain mixture has been soaking in a bourbon-adjacent liquid for days. Research says the mixture is actually a very healthy and low-cost option for farms. The Iowa Corn Growers Association notes that distillers' grains are filled with protein, fat, minerals, and vitamins. And since about 90,000 tons of distillers' grains are produced in the United States each week, the mixture is readily and affordably available. But back to the alcohol. At this point, the bourbon is waiting in the retention tank for barreling. However, before a distiller can add the bourbon to just any old barrel, they must choose the perfect barrel, which is a whole task in and of itself. Barrels are produced by Coopers, just a fancy name for a barrel maker, and the barrel making process is just as important to the end bourbon as any other part of the whiskey's creation. One Eater article looked into the barrel making process by interviewing the owners of the Adirondack Barrel Cooperage. There, Coopers purchased Missouri American oak wood, which is known for being impervious to water and relatively low on tannins, thanks to the growing area's heavy rain and snow. The wood is aged two to five years, then mechanically shaped into the recognizable barrel curvature. After all the wood slats are the right size and shape, a ring is attached, which keeps it all together. Then, the new barrel is heated and charred. Some coopers use steam for this, while others use fire. After the barrel cools, it's cauterized, sealed, sanded, and shipped. And only then is the barrel ready to be filled with bourbon. Good man. You set him up and I'll knock him back, Lloyd, one by one. After the bourbon is in the barrel, it sits there for a while. And just like there are a lot of rules regarding what goes into a bourbon, there are a lot of rules regarding how long a bourbon is aged. As Southern Kitchen states, a bourbon must be aged for at least two years, but no more than four years if it's to be called a straight bourbon whiskey. If a bourbon is going to be called a bottled and bond bourbon, it must be aged for at least four years. If a bourbon is a mixture of multiple bourbons aged for multiple time spans, the number on the bottle should reflect the youngest bourbon's age. Typically, the longer the bourbon stays in the barrel, the more flavor it develops. However, that's not always the case. Most bourbons hit peak flavor around 5 to 10 years, and other factors, such as environment, also play a role in developing the flavor once the bourbon is in the barrel. Beyond just knowing how long a barrel of bourbon has been sitting in the rickhouse, how does a distiller know the bourbon is done? By tasting it, of course. The master distiller at a distillery will sample bourbons directly from the barrel and decide which are ready to be bottled. Master distiller Marianne Barnes said she must be able to identify the nuances of flavor profiles of each of her distillery's brands, as well as be able to identify a barrel's proof and any defects upon tasting. So it's my job at the end of the day to make sure that it, what, what's going into the barrel is as high quality as, as we can make. But tasting all that bourbon isn't as fun as it may sound. Barnes said she's not allowed to smoke, can't wear perfume on the job, and does, quote, a lot of spitting. She also has to recalibrate her senses every once in a while, using scent jars to ensure she's accurately picking up on flavor notes, like oak, cedar, and pepper. She can reportedly do 50 tastings of a 140-proof bourbon before her mouth goes numb, compared to the average drinker's six tastings. Once a master distiller approves a barrel of bourbon for bottling, it can either be chilled for further development. Difford's Guide says this can remove any molecular proteins that might make the bourbon hazy or diluted after bottling, or it can be directly bottled. 
To bottle a whiskey, Whiskey Advocate explains, barrels will be mechanically dumped into a trough. The whiskey is transported into a holding tank and then through an automated bottling process, though sometimes employees are used for special parts of the process, such as dipping each maker's mark bottle into its iconic red wax. The process is quick. Heaven Hill Distillery can reportedly fill as many as 21,000 bottles per hour. Any leftover items from the process are, in many cases, used in a new or inventive way, such as the distiller's grain, which, as mentioned, feeds livestock, or the leftover fusel alcohol from distillation that's sometimes used in perfumes. Some distillers even use the fusel alcohol as a power source. From there, the bottled bourbon is shipped to your favorite local liquor store, and then it's up to you to properly store your bourbon at home, so that all of that hard work on behalf of the distillers, coopers, and others doesn't go to waste. Remember, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. You could have all the talent in the world, but if you don't do the right thing, then nothing happens. Heaven Hill Distillery recommends that you store your bourbon in a cool, dark spot away from heat and sunlight. Additionally, always store your bourbon bottles vertically, never horizontally, and make sure to use a sturdy shelf where bottles won't be in direct contact with a floor or wall. Likewise, don't store your bourbon bottle near an oven, in the attic, or in the back of a car. You want to keep the bottle somewhere between the upper 60s and lower 70s Fahrenheit. If you're collecting whiskey that you aren't putting on display immediately, consider storing it on industrial-style shelving in a clean, dry basement. Though we also totally understand if you don't want to wait to drink that whiskey long enough to start a collection. If you've ever wondered what Vienna sausages are made of, you're not alone. From meat grinders to liquid smoke showers, these tasty little sausages endure a long journey from the factory floor to the shelf of your pantry. The process of making Vienna sausages starts with a huge funnel leading down into an industrial meat grinder. That's where workers dump heaping bins of meat trimmings from chicken, beef, and pork. Most Vienna sausages contain these three types of meats, making them similar to hot dogs. Meat trimmings are exactly what they sound like. When meat packers prepare steaks and chops, they have to cut off uneven and fatty pieces of meat. Those pieces are the trimmings. These irregularly shaped bits would be difficult to sell directly to consumers, so they freeze them into blocks and ship them to factories. There's a limit on the amount of animal fat that they can include because the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, requires that sausages contain no more than 30% fat. The best way to know what type of meat is in your sausage is to read the ingredients label on the back of the can, since the recipes at different plants can vary. Some Vienna sausages contain only chicken, and companies label them as such. Most others contain a high percentage of chicken and less beef and pork. The chatter around Vienna sausage says it includes distasteful ingredients, organs like the heart, liver, kidneys, or worse, infamous pink slime. Did they find anything? They found a little bit of that pink slime. Who knows what goes into those industrial meat grinders? Fortunately, the USDA has strict rules about the way companies label the ingredients in sausage, and the agency's Food Safety Inspection Service ensures manufacturers comply. This means that Vienna sausage makers have to clarify the contents on the ingredients list. Flip the can over, and the ingredients have to say which species of animal these came from and what they are. You'll never see the words pink slime on a label, though. That's because it's another way to say mechanically separated meat. Machines produce this ingredient by forcing meat and bones through a sieve under high pressure, creating a pink, slimy puree. The USDA prohibits the use of mechanically separated beef in human food, but mechanically separated pork is acceptable. Companies must label it as what it is, though, and sausages can't contain more than 20% mechanically separated meat. On the other hand, they can include any amount of mechanically separated poultry they want. Both have to appear in the ingredients list as mechanically separated, though. Grab a can of Libby's or Armour Vienna sausage, and you'll see the first ingredient is indeed mechanically separated chicken. After grinding meat trimmings and mechanically separated chicken into a thick goo, factory workers start pouring additional ingredients into the batter. Adding water or ice smooths out the mix and helps make everything more homogenous. It serves a second purpose as well, keeping it cool. All that grinding can heat the mix. If the batter gets too hot, it'll cook prematurely, so ice is extra handy. There's a limit to this, though. The USDA says cooked sausages can only contain up to 10% water. High water content poses the problem of shrinkage while cooking, though. That's where starch or binder flour comes in to save the day. This ingredient ensures that the final product will preserve its shape as it cooks. Workers pour in bags of salt and spices as well. Finally, and surprisingly, a stream of corn syrup gets poured into the batter. 
This will make the final sausage sweetly attractive to the taste buds. Machines like huge blenders then puree the batter and vacuum out air pockets to make a smooth emulsion after integrating the various ingredients. When casings are filled with Vienna sausage batter, here's what happens. First, a funnel directs batter into a machine that uses just the right amount of pressure to push it through a spout. On that spout, there's a tube of casing. A worker makes a knot at the end of the casing and batter starts flowing into it. The casing expands as it fills and rollers pull the hose of sausage steadily along. One length of Vienna sausage before cutting can measure 80 feet. In the most advanced facilities, machinery automatically loops the sausage onto hooks. In other plants, it's spread on a stainless steel surface until workers hang it on racks to wheel it to the smoker. You may be wondering about the casing since you've never seen it in a can of Vienna sausages. All sausage cooks in membranes, but there are different kinds, edible collagen and indigestible cellulose. Factories use cellulose casing to make Vienna sausage. It's porous, so the flavor of liquid smoke can seep in as it cooks. Since this casing is difficult to digest, machinery strips it off before packaging. That's why you've never noticed it. Hickory smoke flavoring is one of the ingredients listed on barbecue-flavored Armour Vienna sausage. In some cases, workers mix artificial smoke into the batter, but there's a better way to give sausage that distinctive taste, and it's not by using wood smoke. In 1983, Robert R. Hirschfeld of the Baltimore Spice Company applied for a patent under the title Apparatus for Shower Applying Liquid Smoke. Hirschfeld's invention was a shower that recirculated liquid smoke over a constant flow of sausage. According to Hirschfeld, smoking is a particularly important step in making skinless products like hot dogs or Vienna sausage. The reaction of the smoke particles with the protein in the meat causes a sort of coagulation on the surface that holds the wiener together after stripping the casing. Before his invention, manufacturing plants had to wait around 25 minutes after each batch of sausage since they used liquid smoke mists. Using Hirschfeld's machine, the production line never needs to stop. After the drenching of liquid smoke, the sausage moves along to an oven where it bakes. Then, when it comes out of the oven, the product gets another shower. This time, cold, salty water pours over the steaming meat to cool it quickly for packaging. You may have noticed that Vienna sausage doesn't have tied-off ends like hot dogs or cocktail sausages. This is because machinery cuts the sausage into two-inch lengths, just the right size to fit in the can. Before that happens, though, the casing needs to come off, and that involves a sausage peeler. The sausage peeler must be the most fun machine in the whole factory. It uses a tiny knife to cut the casing, steam then blows it off, and a vacuum sucks up the disposable cellulose. To prevent mistakes, the casing often comes with a dark stripe to make it more evident whether sausage has been peeled or not. What makes the machine so entertaining, though, is how it shoots sausage out. In the case of Vienna sausage, it looks like lengthy pink hoses bursting out. Next, workers feed those pink hoses of meat into an apparatus that chops them into perfect little Vienna sausages. Such a machine has only existed since 1955, when the patent office granted an application from Bernard T. Henskin. His machine not only cut the sausage to fit the can, but then turned the metal container as well, preparing it for sealing. Henskin gave Vienna sausage the shape we know today. Maple leaf Vienna sausage, the little sausage that's a little part of our lives. A USDA manual from 1911 describes how plants used to get the Vienna sausages in the can. This repetitive labor fell to women who manually stuffed individual sausages in the cans. For about 40 years, this step of packaging Vienna sausage was a source of employment, but then machines took over. The apparatus described by Bernard Henskin's 1955 patent meant that these can stuffers were laid off or placed at other workstations. His invention wasn't the first of its kind, but previous machinery harmed the sausage while slicing and got gummy from the bits that stuck to it. This new piece of equipment was an improvement. Today, similar machines continue to swiftly cut, count, and group sausages into up to 400 cans per minute. Most often, a can of Vienna sausage comes with seven pieces, but these loaders also allow plants to adjust to lower numbers if necessary. Sausage-filled cans travel along a conveyor and stop under nozzles. Liquid shoots out, filling the cans in less than a second. Then, they zip away to their next stop. The type of packing liquid depends on the variety of Vienna sausage. If it's the original flavor, the liquid is chicken broth. Armour's hot and spicy flavor replaces broth with tomato puree, hot sauce, and vinegar. The barbecue variety contains water, tomato paste, vinegar, smoke flavor, and Worcestershire sauce. A little saucy. A little too saucy. This liquid filling for each of the flavors has been carefully designed to preserve the sausages, but that wasn't always the case. 
In 1961, Ralph Triller and Virgil Rupp of high-grade food products turned in a patent application with the title Product for Packing Vienna Sausages. Within it, they described a problem. The fluid in Vienna sausage cans, usually water or brine, was leaching the protein and seasoning from the little wieners. The longer the sausages were in the can, the more severe the loss of taste and quality. Triller and Rupp proposed a healthier alternative. They suggested filling cans with broth to preserve and add flavor. This practice became commonplace, and now the idea of Vienna sausage without the thick, gooey liquid is unimaginable. Seamers are the machines that seal cans of Vienna sausage. They look like giant wheels with can-sized holes around the edge. The first hole grabs the can, the second places the lid, and the third seals it. The last hole pushes the product back onto the conveyor belt again. In just one minute, this apparatus can process 300 to 600 cans of Vienna sausage. Once the cans are back on the line again, water sprays over them to ensure that they're clean. The cans are then loaded into enormous baskets or racks. These containers will then ferry the cans to a pressure canner. If you wanted to can Vienna sausage at home, you would need to put your jars in a pressure canner for between 75 and 90 minutes to prevent spoilage. Plants that produce canned Vienna sausage have to do the same, but specialized machinery, called retorts, do it much more quickly. Retorts can come in different shapes and sizes. The smallest ones look like giant pressure cookers. They have a manual lid that opens and shuts at the top. Workers use small cranes to lift huge baskets of cans and put them inside. The biggest Vienna sausage factories, like Armour or Libby, have boxcar-sized retorts that take several can-filled racks and process them all at once. After coming out of the retort, cans cool and then go through a labeling machine. They also go through a series of quality controls, like a weight check. It's a high-tech process from start to finish. More high-tech than kangaroos? Even with the fabulous machines and fantastic technology that companies use to make Vienna sausages, sometimes things go wrong. For example, in February 2023, ConAgra Brands recalled nearly 2.6 million pounds of Vienna sausage. Workers noticed leaking cans in warehouses and reported the problem. Something had gone wrong, and the cans got damaged during the sealing process. Fortunately, they caught the mistake before anyone ate the product and got sick. There are so many precise steps that could have caused the issue. Maybe the cans were slightly dented from the very beginning. Perhaps the rollers on the can seamer got bent out of shape. Whatever it was, this error is responsible for millions of pounds of food waste and likely cost Conagra a huge amount of money, not to mention the public's loss of faith in Vienna sausage. There are huge benefits to mass manufacturing, but this experience has highlighted one of the main disadvantages. Perfectly fried eggs, fluffy pastries, heck, just spread it on toast. Forget everything you think you know about lard. Here's the skinny on this once popular fat product. Lard is simply rendered pork fat, but pigs have lots of fat, and fat from different areas will yield lard with slightly different qualities. In general, lard is made from one of two kinds of fat, back fat and fat from around the pig's kidneys, which is known as leaf fat. Lard made from the leaf fat has a milder, more neutral flavor and a paler color, so it's preferred by bakers for sweets such as pies and pastries. They're just honey-sweetened batter. Go on. Deep-fried and hog lard. Lard, you say? On the other hand, back fat yields lard with a more distinctly porky taste. That's not necessarily a bad thing, and in fact can be a plus, depending on how you plan to use your lard. Leaf lard is also much more expensive than back fat, since there's a lot less of it. So if you've made or purchased a batch of pure leaf lard, it is wise to save it for preparations that showcase its clean flavor and pale color. To turn raw pig fat into lard, you need to melt the fat and separate out any impurities. The process is called rendering. There are two basic ways of rendering fat, dry rendering and wet rendering. Both can be used to make lard. Dry rendering, as its name implies, involves melting the fat directly in a container with no added liquid. Wet rendering, on the other hand, involves melting the fat by steaming it or cooking it in water. In industrial settings, the melted fat generated by wet rendering is skimmed off the top of the water or separated from it with a centrifuge. Home cooks making lard by wet rendering can simply refrigerate the melted fat until it hardens, then drain off any remaining water that hasn't evaporated during rendering. Both methods have their advantages and disadvantages. Dry rendering introduces a slightly higher chance of burning the fat before it's fully rendered, since it's directly exposed to heat. Wet rendering requires the additional step of separating the residual liquid after the fat has melted, and each method generates a different flavor profile. Wet rendering creates lard with a lighter color, milder flavor, flavor, and higher smoking point, while dry rendering creates lard with a toastier color and lower smoking point. 
Fans of homemade lard can go on forever about how much better it is than that random box stuff from the supermarket. Besides generally being fresher, homemade lard is free from the preservatives and stabilizers commonly added to industrial lard. Plus, if you choose to make your lard with fat from a pasture-raised pig, it'll more likely be free from any potentially harmful chemicals found in conventionally raised pork. In addition, lard proponents will be quick to tell you that unlike solid vegetable shortening, lard is free from one particularly unhealthy type of fat. It's called trans fat, an industrially produced oil common in the baked, packaged, and fried foods we eat every day. But while homemade lard and the small batch artisanal lard you can sometimes find at butcher shops and farmer's markets are indeed free from trans fat, that's not the case for all industrial lard. Some brands of shelf-stable lard are produced using hydrogenation, resulting in the presence of trans fats. So you'd be getting a double whammy of both saturated animal fats and trans fats. If you do want to try making lard at home, keep watching. To make good quality lard, you need to start with good quality pork fat. Most importantly, you should ensure the fat you use is fresh, since the fresher the fat, the fresher and cleaner your lard will taste. So you know, don't just go dumpster diving for the stuff. Richest, creamiest fat in the world. Fat of the land. Ideally, you should use fat from an animal slaughtered within the past five days. Fat any older than that will render into lard with inferior keeping qualities and a lower smoke point. Once you have your fat, remove as much of the rind as possible as well as any bits of lean meat that may be attached, since they can darken the finished lard. Fat for lard making can be purchased online or from a butcher. Most butchers will have pork fat on hand even if it's not on display. But if you want to get fancy, some serious cooks recommend seeking out farms that pasture raise their pigs to obtain the freshest, highest quality fat. Animals store residue from food additives and chemicals used in conventional commercial farming in their fat. So using fat from animals that have been raised without these chemicals ensures you won't be consuming them either. Well-made lard can range in flavor from completely neutral to faintly porky, and both types are acceptable. Some fans prefer their lard with a more distinctive flavor. It's basically uh, lard balls, um, and it is utterly delicious. However, gamey brown lard is not what anyone wants. Ideally, your lard should turn out pure white when cooled and hardened. First, remove any rind or bits of lean meat from the fat you plan to use before rendering it. Cut the fat into small pieces. This will not only speed up the rendering process, but also ensure any impurities, such as bits of skin, render out fully. Next, be sure to render your fat over low heat. Higher heat can brown or burn the fat, which again is not what you want. Also, stir the fat regularly as it renders to prevent it from sticking to the sides or bottom of your cooking pan, which can also result in browning. Finally, don't overdo it. Take your lard off the heat as soon as it's fully rendered. You'll know it's ready when the cracklings, or crispy bits of fatty residue, turn amber, and steam stops rising from the hot fat, meaning all the water has been cooked out. Lard is valued by cooks around the world for its great frying qualities and the tender, flaky quality it lends to baked goods. It's also valued for its relatively neutral flavor. Well-rendered lard will be mildly flavored enough not to overwhelm the other ingredients in a dish. In some cases, it's even better than butter. Some lard fans love it enough to eat it as a snack. Mmm. Mmm. It's delicious. I'll hear you. Yeah. If you count yourself among these fans, you might want to try a relatively little-known but super-rich Italian specialty, lardo, or cured flavored pig fat. Traditionally, it's treated like a cold cut and served in ultra-thin, melt-in-your-mouth slices on toasted bread or used in pastas. Other cultures around the world have similar preparations. While it sounds fancy and exotic, in reality, it requires far less hands-on work than regular rendered lard. All you need to do is procure a good quality piece of pork back fat, rub it with salt, curing salt, and flavorings that may include rosemary, bay leaves, and pepper, seal in an airtight plastic bag, and set it in the refrigerator for at least three months to cure. Cut into thin slices to serve. It will keep in the fridge for about four months. While making lard is perfectly safe for those who know their way around the kitchen, it does have its risks. Even though lard is rendered at low heat, melted fat can seriously burn your skin. And the risk of a grease fire is real, especially if you get distracted and walk away from the stove. So keep a close eye on your lard and don't let it overheat. If your lard does catch fire, do not 
pour water on it. The burning lard will just float on top of the water and might spill out of your pot, spreading the fire. To put out the fire, use a fire extinguisher if you have one, or quickly cover the pot with a lid and remove it from the heat to smother the flames. Also remember, your finished lard will be hotter than it looks. It's deceptive because it won't bubble like boiling water. So if you plan to store your lard in plastic containers, ensure the lard is below 212 degrees Fahrenheit before filling the containers to keep them from melting. And if you're using glass containers, use only those designed for canning and pre-warm them so they won't shatter when filled with hot lard. As you render your lard, you'll notice the cut-up pieces of pork fat gradually shrinking as they start to liquefy. As the rendering progresses, some of the pieces stubbornly refuse to melt any further. Instead, they'll stay intact and at some point will start to fry and brown in the liquefied fat. Don't be alarmed by this. These fatty bits or cracklings are not only a totally normal byproduct of lard rendering, but to many are the best part of the long process because they're a rich, crunchy, and utterly delicious little treat. If you enjoy pork rinds, cracklings will be right up your alley. Pork rind. Pork rind. You can always just salt them and snack on them, but creative cooks have found numerous other ways to use them. They are a great substitute for bacon bits, for instance, and make a tasty topper for soups or salads. They can also be tossed with stir-fried or sautéed veggies for an extra burst of crunch and flavor. There's no getting around it. Making lard is a long, hot process that requires patience and a vigilant watch. If you want good quality lard, you can't rush this process, but you can make it a little easier on yourself and less dangerous by making your lard in a slow cooker. Rendering your lard this way with even gentler heat than a stovetop will take longer, but because you don't need to stand by the stove and stir the mixture as often, you'll have a lot less work to do. The Crock Watcher. While it's doing your cooking, you could be doing other things. The process is pretty much like rendering lard on a stovetop. Put your trimmed, finely chopped pork fat in the cooker with some water and cook on low without a lid for several hours. Stir about once an hour. Be aware, though, that the cracklings left behind after slow cooker rendering will be soft rather than crisp, but you can always crisp them up later in a frying pan. One of the benchmarks of good quality lard is a clean white appearance with no suspicious little bits suspended in it. This is not only for aesthetic purposes, but also to improve the shelf life of the lard. To ensure your lard is clean and clear, don't just trust your eyes. Instead, strain it carefully to ensure all impurities, including small bits, are removed. This means using a fine mesh strainer, several layers of cheesecloth, or fine muslin. Make sure your strainer or any cloth you use is perfectly clean to ensure your lard doesn't pick up any off flavors. If you're going to all the trouble to make your own lard, you want something you'll be proud to cook with and eat. So to avoid having all your hard work go to waste, be sure to treat your lard with care after you make it. Like any meat-based product, lard can go bad if not properly protected and stored. A few basic steps will help prevent your lard from going rancid, according to information posted by the American Meat Science Association. First, ensure all impurities are removed from the lard before it's stored. Second, cool your lard as quickly as possible after it's rendered. Once the lard is cooled, transfer it to small containers for storage. To minimize air exposure, fill storage containers completely and seal them tightly. Store the containers in a cool, dark space. Light and heat will degrade the quality of your lard, according to Soulful Prepper. Filtered lard will keep in the fridge for about a year or in the freezer for about two years. The Jawbreaker is a show stealer in the world of candy. From its scary sounding name to its trademark white coat and rainbow paint, we've got all the sweet details for you to munch on. So let's dive deeper into how they're really made. In some cases, just the name of the candy is intimidating, like Jawbreakers. Though these candies seem to last forever, you probably remember getting to the sweet, sour center of a Jawbreaker and feeling that sense of a job well done. For classic jawbreakers, that hard candy center is where candy makers start their work. Weighted tumble blocks are placed into an industrial-sized panner. These tumble blocks crush and mix the candy center ingredients together into a fine powder. Dextrose, powdered coloring, flavoring, and fruit acids are added to the panner along with the blocks. The powdery mixture then gets transferred to a custom pill press device. There, a high-powered piston molds it into the round, tangy candy center we all know and love. We can't forget what goes into making the center of another popular kind of jawbreaker, the ones with bubblegum in the middle. Bubblegum centers require a different process in the beginning, though the layering process is roughly the same as with hard-centered jawbreakers. Candy makers blend synthetic rubbers with powdered resin to dissolve the rubber. Then, thickeners and preservatives are added. After a four-hour steaming and mixing process, the mixture is placed into trays for cooling. The batter cools for 24 hours, and then corn syrup is added for softness and sweetness. Finally, sugar 
Sugars and flavors are added to the gum, as well as icing sugar, which makes the gum easier to chew. Several machines are used to slice and shape the gum into ball centers for jawbreakers. Once these gum balls are cool, they're ready for building on layers to create a jawbreaker. Creating those layers is actually the most time-consuming part of the jawbreaker-making process. Once the hard candy centers are finished, they're taken to a room with rotating panners. This room is where the candies are spun in while the syrup is added to create multiple layers of flavoring and color. Next, more dextrose powder is added to help build up those layers. Then come multiple stages of flavored coloring, like cherry, lime, lemon, and blueberry. Each layer must have two hours to set before another layer can be added, so you can imagine how long this process can take. The coating increases increases the size of the candies into the big jawbreakers we're used to seeing and chomping on. We know it's a classic jawbreaker the second we see that classic white coating and rainbow paint splatter. Some think that the origin of the white coating came from an Italian treat called confetti or Jordan almonds. It may have inspired the confetti-like paint splatters we see on jawbreakers today. Once all flavored coloring has been added, two more layers of white coating are added to the candy. A glaze is poured onto the candies to seal in all the layers. Finally, candy makers use spray bottles of coloring on the candy while the panning machine rotates to ensure an overall paint splatter effect. They call them gobstoppers across the pond, like the everlasting gobstoppers in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, but they're not just everlasting to eat, they're everlasting to make. While some jawbreaker candies take just a few days, other versions can take more than three weeks to complete. Take, for example, the Jawbusters brand of Jawbreakers. The company starts with a tiny, single granule of sugar and adds liquid sugar to build it up to half the size of a Jawbuster. Just creating this sugary center takes about 21 days. The company then follows up with colors and flavoring in a traditional Jawbreaker layering process. If you've had Jawbusters before, you know these aren't even the biggest Jawbreakers around. Can you imagine how long it would take to make those huge Jawbreakers you see in candy stores? Our giant two and a quarter inch bruiser Jawbreaker Jawbreaker took about 12 days to make. While we don't know when jawbreakers were invented, we do know the older methods of making similar coated candies were very labor-intensive. Early coating pans were just kettles suspended on a chain that a person had to manually swing over an open fire. Candy making advanced somewhat in the early 1800s when pans fitted with shafts were invented. However, these pans still had to be manually turned during the coating process. In 1860, the industrial era enabled the manufacturing of industrial pans and introduced panning techniques that candy makers still use used today for coated candy. Today, we have updated versions of industrial pans that are automated and capable of making large batches of jawbreakers at a time. Bruisers look just like classic jawbreakers, with white coating and paint splatter designs, except they're humongous. They measure up to over three inches in diameter. That's bigger than your average golf ball. Before you start eating a bruiser, though, make sure you've set aside plenty of time and energy. The standing official world record for the time it takes to eat a mega bruiser jawbreaker is 17 days, 4 hours, 8 minutes, and 19 seconds. Another variation of the jawbreaker is the popular atomic fireball. These fiery candies are a bright red color to match the spicy taste. Since candies like these are meant to last a long time, we recommend that only spicy food lovers try these flaming fireballs of sweetness. Jawbreakers have been around so long that myths and stories about them abound. You may have heard the same urban legend we came across, which is that some jawbreakers have exploded and injured people before. Unfortunately, this is one urban legend that turned out to be true, as shown by an episode of Discovery's Mythbusters show. Police records confirm that a jawbreaker exploded when a young child took just one lick at the candy after microwaving it. Another nine-year-old's jawbreaker exploded when she licked the candy, which left severe, painful chemical burns on her face and arms. The hosts of Mythbusters decided to look into what conditions conditions caused these jawbreaker explosions. They confirmed that the combined effect of keeping it in the plastic wrap and leaving it out to sit in the heat made the candy molten and hard. Clueless is a popular 90s throwback movie, but have you heard of its darker, campier cousin, Jawbreaker? Starring 90s goth queen Rose McGowan, this black comedy is often compared to other famous movies such as Heathers and Mean Girls. In the movie, a group of well-dressed, popular girls always celebrate each other's birthdays with a frightening prank. The prank takes a fatal turn on their ringleader's birthday when they gag her with a giant jawbreaker that ends up choking her to death. 
The rest of the movie involves the gang trying to cover up their accident in a web of blackmail, deceit, and of course, head-to-toe makeovers. Though this movie wasn't loved by critics when it came out, it has since become a cult classic and an important remnant of 90s-era retro aesthetics. The literally killer story remains a source of inspiration for costume designers and movie makers alike. In fact, the slowed-down hallway walk from Mean Girls bears a striking resemblance to the scene in Jawbreaker. And, of course, this story gives the Jawbreaker even more notorious cult status as an edgy and decorative candy for the ages.